Before I call the meeting to order, I just wanted to welcome everybody to come into our, our meeting today. We've got a lot of fun stuff on the agenda today. I know everybody's excited about it and a couple of people to, uh, uh, to thank. And I just wanted to say something real quick. Back in April of this year, we made an announcement that we were going to have a June 1st was going to be the day that we were going to lift the, the mask mandate. And we were all very, very excited about that. And this, this, um, this last year, this 2020, 2021 was, was challenging. And we just got finished celebrating our graduates this year and watching them go across the stage and, and how excited we were for them. And we did that without any masks too. That was really fun. Um, but I wanted to take just a moment on behalf of the board and just say thank you to all of our teachers and administrators and leadership out there that actually went through this with us and took on a lot of fiery, fiery darts uh, and, and a, lot of, a lot of criticism for a, a mandate that they had no control over. And we had partnerships in the community that helped us accomplish that. So I, I just wanted to make that note that we have a little over 65,000 students in our school district and 84 percent of those students chose to go to school and it was because of the mask mandate that we had that the the uh, montgomery county hospital district worked with us that when there was uh, covid cases and we had our fair share we didn't have one single school closed which meant that all of those 84 percent of those students could continue to go to school and our teachers were true heroes on adapting on the fly a lot of times on how they were gonna teach um, remotely, uh, kindergarten kids in front of a TV and all of those things. And, and I just wanted to say thank you. And I wanted to thank uh, personally our school board as well for sitting up here and supporting our teachers and our administrators by wearing a mask. And I can tell you that it wasn't comfortable for all of us. We, we, we put our indifferences aside and said, we wanna support uh, our students and our teachers by doing what we're asking them to do as well. And so I just want to take a moment to, to thank those administrators and teachers and of course my board for putting up with, with that and we are excited June 1st is finally here we can do it with our masks. So. so with that, I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present that this meeting has been duly called and the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is 6.02. Would you please join um, Scott Moore in our invocation and also uh, Mr. Dachshun Williams in our pledge. If you're so inclined, I invite you to stand with me. I would invite you into a moment of silence if you so choose and then I will close with a few words. God of all people in all places at all times. We pause tonight to give you thanks for a successful school year, for the opportunity to watch over 4,000 graduates walk across the stage and complete their very difficult journey. We give you thanks for all the people who helped make that possible. We pray for those who are in our summer school programs right now, those educators, those students who are giving uh, their time and their efforts we celebrate tonight those who, who work behind the scenes, those who are not in the classrooms or in the front office, but those who, who keep our students fed and healthy, those who keep our campuses clean and sanitary, those who safely transport our children to and from school. God, in this age of division, help us to achieve a unity of purpose, to serve the children and the constituents of this district. Let us not give in to a false narrative which seeks to divide, but send us your spirit to build up, to unify, and to guide us. God, we pray that your spirit would be with us tonight, that we would make the decisions that are best for the students of this district and best for this community. We lift our prayers to you by all the names and in all the ways that we know you. Amen. Amen. Our national flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. State flag. Honor, Honor the Texas flag. flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one 
Lord's sake, under God, one, one and indivisible. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Item 2A, Special Board Recognition, CTE Skills USA 2021 State Champions. Dr. Noel. All right. You know, it's always an honor, um, and we're on a multi month roll now of honoring state champions. Uh, we see our kids excelling in many ways, and this may be the first time that we've had an opportunity to bring forth state champions from CTE in the Skills USA competition, and uh, we're really proud of these students. And here tonight to make the, the uh, recognition is Ms. Tally Stout, our Director of Career and Technical Education. Ms. Stout. Good evening, President Hubert, board members, and Dr. Knoll. We are honored to present to you tonight Conroe ISD, the Skills USA state champions and national qualifiers. Skills USA is a career and technical education student organization that is partnerships of students, teachers, and industry working together to ensure America has a high skilled workforce. We, the Skills USA Championships are career skill competitions that showcase the best CT students in the nation. These contests begin locally and progress to the state and national level. This spring, the following Conroe ISD students won the state championship in their respective events. At this time, I would like to introduce their teacher and then have the student come forward. Grand Oaks. Ms. Loretta Jones is their teacher. Mr. Levi McLaughlin. And Mr. Stephen Walls. They competed in digital cinema production and just, just submitted their national production. I'll stand up here. Stand up here. <laughs> Mr. Brian Reeves of Conroe High School. Our first is Mr. Angel Camacho. Angel uh, uh, participated in automotive estimating. Giovanni Lobato couldn't be with us. He had to work today. And Walter Fuentes. He participated in automotive refinishing. Nice. All right. The Woodlands High School also had two participants and Mr. Falk was their teacher and they will pre be presented their awards on campus. All right. Thank you all. I just want to say on behalf of the board, uh, congratulations to everyone that participated. Imagine you can go to school and you come out four years later, you have an industry level certificate that makes you workforce ready that immediately on graduating high school, if you want to, you can go into the workforce and make a meaningful wage, a living wage that will help you throughout your lifetime. So I just want to say congratulations to you on that. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations again. Appreciate you. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's all you do. Great job. Congratulations. Great job. Congratulations. Great job. Congratulations. Great job. 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 Great job.
All right, item B, Special District Recognition Patrons Influencing Education Award, Montgomery County Officials, Dr. Noel. All right, well, I'm gonna, uh, you know, typically I would hand this item off to someone else, but I'm gonna present this tonight, if that's okay with you. Yes, President sir. Hubert, I'll, I'll kind of make my way up front so I'm not hiding behind a column here. So as Mr. Hubert started the meeting off, you talked about the importance of uh, us completing a school year successfully and allowing those students to graduate this year. And it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of effort of many people in this room, our teachers, our parents, but we could not do what we did alone. It could not have happened. Uh, we needed the support of our great community and to allow us to make it happen. And so we have so much to be proud of as a community. As Mr. Hubert mentioned, to have the largest percentage of students learning on campus of any of the large school districts in the state of Texas, um, to be able to keep our schools open. Those are all partnerships that we had to work closely with other leaders to help us make that happen. So tonight we wanna to recognize the county government. And I will tell you, uh, I go back a year and a half ago to spring break, and I think it was Tuesday of spring break when Judge Keogh called me on my cell phone and from that moment on, Judge Keogh and I talked to each other on the cell phone <laughs> hours a day, every single day, um, for the better part of three or four months as we worked through the previous school year and were we gonna have an opportunity to reopen or not? Um, how would we make that happen? And it was a constant communication. And then as we approached this school year, those same communications continued to happen, not only with Judge Keogh, but with all of our elected officials on the commissioner's court. So all of the commissioners as well, back and forth, constantly with support. And for me, I look at this as a perfect example of what a community should expect from local government. You should expect us to work together for the betterment of the community. And that's exactly what we did. So in, in addition to all of the support along the way, we reached a point last year where there was CARES Act funding available and the commissioner's court needed to make a decision of how to invest their money that they received from the federal government. We had many conversations once again with Judge Keogh, all of the commissioners, uh, not only on behalf of Conroe ISD, but of all the school districts uh, in the county. And the commissioner's court made the decision to invest some of their funds into local school districts, which makes all the sense in the world, right? It's where all our children are, but in addition to that, we are by far the largest employer in the county as well. So an investment in us is not, not only investment in children, but it's an investment in the workforce and making sure that we have um, a great economy in our county. And so that commissioner's court invested $19 million in Conroe ISD last year. That's what allowed us to make sure that we had all of the PPE that was necessary this year, that we could hire all the extra nurses that we needed to hire to make this happen. Everything that we were able to do, we were able to do because we knew that we had their support, not only financially, but also that they would stand beside us. And so we wanted to take this opportunity tonight to recognize our county officials. And they can't all be here tonight, but to represent Commissioner's Court, we are honored to have with us here tonight, Judge Mark Keogh. Judge, if you could come forward, we'd like to honor you this evening.
staff is what makes a lot of things happen. And the emergency response staff uh, in the county, we've always had a wonderful relationship with them. But it's really become even stronger over the last year. So to present uh, to the staff, I'm going to ask Mr. McCord to come up and make that presentation. Good evening, President Huber, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. I have two gentlemen to present to you this evening as Pi Award winners from Conroe ISD. Those two nominees are Mr. Darren Hess, Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Montgomery County. Uh, Mr. Hess is busy uh, doing storm preparation tonight in a planning meeting, so he will not be able to be with us. And also Mr. Jason Millsaps, Executive Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Montgomery County. These two key Montgomery County leaders were pivotal in working quickly, collaboratively, amicably, and efficiently to transition our Wood Forest Bank Stadium facility to a setup that could serve as a long-term vaccination site, serving the citizens of our area and beyond. Mr. Hess and Mr. Millsaps saw, tweaked, and eliminated roadblocks that helped our cooperative effort provide vaccination rates that at its peak saw more than 5,000 county residents a day being immunized, <laughs> including many of us here tonight. Mm -hmm. Although the county and CISD worked before together, this was a watershed event showing what can happen when organizations care and are willing to work together. In sharing a personal experience, my father drove many miles as an 84-year-old to obtain his vaccination at the Wood Forest Bank Stadium facility. Unbeknownst to Mr. Hess and Mr. Millsaps, they together assisted my father in the process, took away any anxiety he had over the shot in the traffic flow lane, and prompted my dad to call me unsolicited to brag on these two individuals, even though my father had no idea who they were. Thank you. So without further ado, I present to you tonight uh, in spirit, Mr. Hess, and in person, Mr. Millsaps. Thank you very much. Set that pie down right here. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate all you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. Congratulations on your pie. Thank you so much. We appreciate everything you've done for all your hard work. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, item C, Special Board Recognition, Ambassador Award, Child Nutrition Depart Department Employees. Dr. Okay. Mayor. Mr. McCord, once again. Good evening again, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. I'm here to introduce to you this evening three leaders within our CISD operations <coughs> department. These three outstanding directors will present to you their departmental ambassador award nominees for this year. Before going forward, I want to take a moment to share our appreciation from operations for all of you done to support us by helping keep our group safe and allowing our team to attract and retain top quality personnel. It is appreciated, especially in a very competitive market. Uh, your foundation of caring helps all of us make a real difference for children and parents, and as we've seen this year more than ever, the community. Our three operations leaders here tonight to introduce their ambassador award nominees in order will be Robin Hughes, Director of Child Nutrition, Marshall Schrader, Director of Custodial and Maintenance, and Sam Davila, Director of Transportation. Without further ado, I present to you Mrs. Robin Hughes. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null. 
Thank you for recognizing our child nutrition ambassadors tonight. Our first ambassador is Melissa Rodriguez. <laughs> Melissa's been with the district for two years and she's an associate at York Junior High. She's very positive and communicates well with students, staff, and the parents. She always has a smile on her face and never complains. She doesn't have to be asked to help. She just jumps in where needed. We're so proud to have Melissa on our team. Yes. Our next ambassador is Mary Lou Palmer. Mary Lou is an associate at Pete Junior High, and she's been with the Child Nutrition Department for over seven years. She serves as a role model for others by her actions. She comes to work every day with a great attitude and provides excellent customer service. She's well liked by our coworkers and students and has such a caring nature. We're fortunate to have her in our department. <laughs> Next, we have Maria Guerra. Maria is an associate at Travis Intermediate, and she's been with, with us for over 20 years. Wow. wow. All right. All right. She does a great job taking charge in the kitchen when needed and can handle any challenges that come along. She goes above and beyond her duties and is always willing to help others. She has a great rapport with the students and staff and takes pride in serving quality meals. Her dedication to Conroe ISD is appreciated. Our final ambassadors, Lisa Wilson and Noemi Rodriguez, were unable to be here tonight. Lisa's the manager at Grangerland Intermediate and she's been with us for 13 years. She's a strong person and a strong leader. Feeding students quality meals is her number one priority and she makes everyone feel special. Noemi is an associate at Sam Houston Elementary and has been with us for seven years. She cares about the students' well-being and they're always happy to see her. She never hesitates to jump in when needed and she's a pleasure to have. So thank you. Thank you. Well, what another wonderful opportunity to celebrate our cafeteria ladies and our food dudes as they were named last year. Many people don't realize that um, our cafeteria staff worked all spring, worked all summer, and then again worked full time in the mornings to make sure that every child who needed a meal had a meal. And so without them, um, many kids would be going to class. Um, hungry and, and unable to focus on their work. But their tummies were full and their spirits were high and their meals were filled with love. So thank you to our cafeteria service workers, thank you. Um, Marshall Schrader is the Director of Maintenance and Custodial and he'll now present his ambassadors. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Hubert, <laughs> board members, Dr. Null. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to announce the Maintenance and Custodial Department Ambassador Award recipients tonight. Uh, it's been a, a rough year uh, between storms and the apocalypse freeze, as Mr. McCord <laughs> likes to say, and power outages and rolling power outages. The Maintenance and Custodial Department has always been there to, to serve the district. Uh, first nominee is uh, Rosalia Juarez. Please come forward. Rosalie has been with the department since 2014. She's currently assigned as a day fill-in in North Custodial and covers, covers outages at campuses during the day. She's always willing to go above and beyond. She frequently stayed over to cover outages this year due to COVID. 
Her dedication, enthusiasm, and positive attitude makes her a valuable member of the custodial department. Next up is Donald Perry. <laughs> Donald started with, with CISD in 2008. He'll do anything that's asked of him, no matter the time of day. He's always smiling, happy, inspiration to work with. He often works closely with other crafts. Donald is an asset to the department and the district as a whole. <laughs> Next up is Jesse Johnson. Jesse is serving as his 27th year as the district locksmith. <clears throat> He's a dedicated team member who is committed to the staff and students of CISD. He's very knowledgeable and instrumental in the plan and review of district door hardware schedules. He addresses work orders in a timely and professional manner. manner. Uh, Jesse is also assist in law safety department as needed. He's a valuable team member and steps up to each challenge with a positive attitude. Awesome. Next up is Earl Williams. Earl always has a positive attitude no matter what's going, around, going on around him. He's always on time and has consecutive years of perfect attendance. So many I couldn't go back far enough to give that number. <laughs> uh, he does whatever is asked of him without complaining. Earl is the model employee and I wish I had more like him. Wow. Aww. Next up is Hortensia Rios. Hortensia has been with the department since 2003. She's currently assigned to Hauser Elementary. She's done a great job and always with a positive attitude. She has frequently stayed over to cover outages at her campuses and other campuses in South County this year. She's a valuable member of the custodial department. <laughs> Last but not least, Larry McCain is not able to be with us tonight. He's on a very well-deserved vacation. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he is, uh, but I, I do want to recognize him before the board tonight. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Marshall and team on behalf of the board. Again, you mentioned it was a, a rough year, to say the least, uh, last year, but you guys shined all the way through. You guys always do a phenomenal job of keeping our facilities, our grounds, everything maintained. We truly have top-notch facilities in CISD because of you guys, unsung heroes of CISD, and we cannot, cannot say thank you enough and I know these brothers doing 20 some odd years. That's really got to be a serious labor of love. You guys, kudos you guys for that. Thank you, brother. Good job, man. All right. Thank you to those who presented and Ms. Wagman and Mr. Williams for your remarks. Uh, who are right on. Thank you for that. Transportation. Uh, one more. Right. And we got one more. Um, 2E, Special Board Recognition, Ambassador Award, Transportation Department Employees. Dr. Noll. Mr. Dogma. President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noll, it's my pleasure to be up here today to recognize uh, this year's Transportation Ambassador Awards. Um, <coughs> I'm a little different, so I'm going to start off with the, the folks that aren't here right now, and then we'll end off with the folks that are here. But uh, a couple of them were not able to make it today. One of them is Mr. Robert Hicks. He is a driver out of our Oak Ridge Transportation Center. Uh, he is always uh, promoting a positive image, and some of you might have seen him in the paper. He's the one that was, uh, he's recruiting them really small nowadays. <laughs> nice, yeah. Really good. yeah, and it was such a special story and, and just came straight from his heart. And so it's wonderful to have people like that in our department. Uh, they do it unsolicited. They don't do it for the recognition. They do it because they care for kids, and that's the kind of people we want. Uh, next, and I'd just like to say her name, is Sally Lou Crawford. Uh, she is one of our drivers out of our Conroe Transportation Center. Uh, this is a time when our drivers usually do medical attention and everything over the summer because it gets them ready for the next school year, so she's not able to be here today. But uh, uh, Miss Allie Lou, she uh, actually recognized that there was a toddler walking on the side of the road, and uh, she had the wherewithal to pull over, check on the child, 
called operations. I actually had the PD, our PD come and take possession of the child and make sure the child stayed safe and the child got safely home. So once again, you know, quality people that we have. So um, now folks that are here, uh, I'd like to start off with uh, Ms. Maria Broussard, uh, even though, Maria, even though she's only been here with us for four years, she has made quite an impression. Uh, she's always uh, promoting a positive and nurturing bus environment and for her students. Uh, she was recently recognized uh, by the Pearl Finch Museum of Fine Arts as a patriot of courage. And um, you might have saw her picture. She normally has a little bit more dress uh, costume going on, uh, but uh, I know her kids love it, and uh, it's it's a wonderful thing. Um, I wish she I had a bus driver like her when I was a kid. It made it so much fun. Uh, next, Miss Teresa Smith. Miss Smith is one of our drivers out of our East County Transportation Center. Uh, she always creates a caring and can-do atmosphere uh, for all her employees or all the people that work with her and gives her ability uh, to work, and she has the ability to work with anyone and is always willing to help. And we definitely appreciate that, especially as you know, my predecessor talked about the difficulties with COVID and absences and drivers that are willing to step in and cover another run or cover a route. It's just so appreciated. Uh, next is uh, Miss Sandra Moreno. Sandra. <laughs> Sandra is actually one of our special needs routers. Uh, she's at the Conroe Transportation Center. Um, her 26 years of dedication wow. and passion <laughs> for our special needs students is, is unwavering. Um, you, you ask any Diag in the, in the district and they know who Sandra is. Uh, she just <laughs> always carry. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Jason Pryor. He's one of our drivers out of the Woodlands Transportation Center. <laughs> Mr. Pryor has decided to retire at a young age of 85. Hope you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> Mr. Pryor is well liked by all of his colleagues and the parents and students. He just provides such a special environment for the students and he's always caring. And uh, he is a trooper. He went out, uh, got sick, and then came back to work afterwards and just such a trooper. So an amazing group of folks. Thank you. On behalf of the board, we just want to say thank you again for all you do. We have all driven in Montgomery County traffic and cannot imagine doing it with 50 elementary kids in the back seat. Um, these guys have a stellar safety record, if you're not aware of that. They drive hundreds of thousands of miles in this department every year. Seven million. Seven million miles a year that our transportation department drives. Um, and they do it with an outstanding safety record and it's because of the dedication, the professionalism of these folks. So again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Moore, Mr. Davila, <laughs> for all those who participated. Moving on to our item three, which is citizen participation. Have we had anybody sign up today? Yes, we have. Okay, the next item on the agenda is public comments for those who have registered to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not the appropriate form to bring complaints for which resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item, they must be addressed by, the, by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the board has an obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that could personally identify a student. The board cannot <clears throat> permit comments that include student names or any information that might identify a specific student. This prohibition does not apply to if the person speaking is a student's parent or guardian or is over, or is over the age of 18 and seeks speaking about him or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's agenda, posted agenda, the board will defer its discussion of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. 
For any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. For each person is limited to no more than three minutes for their comments. This will allow the board to hear from citizens as well as ensure that the board meetings runs efficiently as there are many important items on the board's agenda that must be considered. Each speaker's three minute time limit will be displayed on the screens around the room. When the countdown time reaches zero, the speaker's time has come to an end and the next speaker will be called. Everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Any person who does not conduct him or herself accordingly will be asked to leave or will be escorted from the room. Ms. Godfrey, will you please call our first person? Savannah Eldridge. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Savannah Eldridge, and uh, I've taken the time to come today to speak out in favor of uh, CRT. Um, I believe that CRT is a framework that would help us examine the systemic cause and effect of racism, and I believe that's important uh, to correct false narratives that these teachings are attempting to rewrite history, when in actuality, I believe that it's the basis to explore the truth um, and help us to actually conceptualize what's being taught versus what is actually uh, occurring. So uh, to help me get a better understanding, um, I took a look around and found that um, actually these uh, teachings are not even occurring in Conroe. So when I was watching the last board meeting, I really was trying to understand, you know, what the public outcry was. What was the outcry from the community uh, and, and the legislation from on the state and federal uh, level. But we, as we examine the facts about the history of our state and our great nation, like the truth could not be ignored. And CRT actually, it, it uh, expels or dispels um, that every individual is racist, but, we know, but it also examines that uh, there are systems of racism and laws that govern us that cannot be denied. One of those systems being slavery, which has not been abolished um, and is still going through the penal system. Um, and in my research, I actually found that this actual school board contracts to use labor of those incarcerated in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to repair uh, bus tires. And so I think that things like that, the truth of the matter and issues the, uh, that affect community uh, need to be uh, told in a way uh, that's not one-sided, that's not told from a single lens. Um, the weight of the opposition of CRT is rooted in fear. Uh, for our children. I have those same fears for my children based on my lived experience. And even today, as I try to carefully craft my words, um, I'm listening to the invocation and, you know, I heard the words false narrative of division. And that's not what I'm seeing going on with CRT. And I just want to make sure that people understand this, this is an attempt to have both sides told and to adhere to the truth of the history of our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Johnson. Hello, I'm here to address the school board today about the CRT. CRT should be taught in schools because students need to know both sides, not a whitewashed version. Current events need to be talked about as early as the 1800s, or as late as the 1800s, and all the way up to 2021. 1953, U.S. government la launched Operation Wetback. Do our students even know about that? Have they been taught that? I'm biracial, I'm Puerto Rican, and I'm black. I am a Latina, and I'm very proud of that. The program sends people to Mexico, Mexican descent, more than three 3.8 million people were deported through the operation. Many, American, many of those were American citizens. Do any of our students know that? Let's not whitewash 1931, when sworn police officers grabbed Mexican-Americans in the area, U.S. citizens shoved them into waiting, room, waiting vans to ship them out back across where they thought they should be. You can't teach critical race theory through a single lens. If you teach, if you teach about ain't 
and Anson Jones, the president of the Republic of Texas, then students should know the history of us, slavery, teaching about 1850, the fugitive slave laws established and enforced by the United States federal government. Teach them about Harriet Breacham Stowe, the black activist who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. We are unapologetically in this country black, built on the blood, sweat, tears, life, and deaths of black people. The Texas Coalition of Black Democrats will hold each one of you accountable on the school board for what happens with the curriculum. It's important that they know both sides, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great that are celebrated, whether they are black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Island Pacificers. No one should be excluded. We are asking for inclusion and all sides of the story be told. Thank you. Thank you. Carl White. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Carl White, and I am proud to say I'm the president of Montgomery County NAACP, and I am here to in support of critical race theory. United States history is very ugly, but United States history is true. It's a true fact that in 1667, the Virginia General Assembly declared the baptism of slaves would not exempt them from bondage. It's a true fact. The Virginia General Assembly in 1669 passed an act about the casual killing of slaves. It's a true fact that Thomas Jefferson, the third US president and the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, believed that black people were inferiorly inferior to white people and thought the two races need to be separated. It's a true fact that the 17th US president, Andrew Johnson said, this is a country for white men, and by my God, as long as I'm president, it should be a government for white men. It's a true fact that Chief Justice Roger B. Tanner stated in 1857, Dred Scott decision that black people have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. It's a true fact, in 1860, Three billion dollars was assigned to physical bodies of enslaved black Americans to be used as free labor. Instead of monetary gain, they were rewarded with whooping, hanging, and rape and starvation. It's a true fact that on March the 21st, 1861, Vice President Andrew Stevenson of the Confederacy State of America declared that slavery was a national, the natural condition of blacks and the Confederacy was founded on slavery. It's a true fact. We all know that President uh, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, free and black slaves. But to ease the slave owners' pain, they were given $300 for each slave. The free slaves was not provided any resources. It's a true fact. And the delegates of the Louisiana Constitution Conference in 1865 resolved, we hold this to be a government of white people made to be perpetrated to the exclusive benefit of white people. It's a true fact that U.S. Senator James O. Eastland, 1941, known as the Boys of the South and Godfather of Mississippi, we will protect and maintain white supremacy throughout history. It's a true fact that Ms. Viola Luzzi, a white uh, Detroit housewife, mother of five, was killed by Ku Klux Klan, simply trying to help people to vote. In 1968, it's a true fact that the current commission declared that white racism, not black anger, turned the key that unlocked urban American turmoil the presidentially appointed panel reported, white society is deeply indicated, implicated in the ghetto, white institution created it, and white institution maintained it. Please do not change your policies not to teach critical race theory. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Diane Daniels. Good evening. Um, Dr. No, thank you for referring me to Bethany Medford, um, the superintendent of middle schools of Conroe ISD. I am partnering with her um, in July and August to deliver the pocket constitution and bill of rights to all eighth grade campuses. So thank you for that. Um, it is a free program, so I have all the cases coming to my home and I look forward to partnering with her in delivering all those, uh, seeing that our children are given this a free item. 
Um, I am aware uh, of some of the decisions that the board have made, and this, in fact, was a good one. Um, I am confused about other ones, though. Keeping masks on our children the rest of the school year after Governor Abbott lifted the mandate on March 10th, 2021. We the people need to know how each of you voted on this and when, or if you did vote. Um, we need to know that the masks will not sneak back in for the next school year. Based on the CDC standards and guidelines, which we all seem to be referring to, there is a 99.9% .9 recovery rate and masks affect the oxygen level, which allows you to make a sound and clear judgment. Um, I also am concerned that Conroe ISD partnered with Kelsey Siebel to give the COVID-19 experimental jab to the students ages 12 to 17 years old. Again, who voted for this being partnered with and sent out to all the uh, parents of the district? It is an experimental bioagent. You voted to make the children lab rats by sending this information out. A private organization is not what we voted into the board. All the Conroe ISD parents were notified about the jab offered on 6-5 and come upcoming on 626 from 9 to 4 at Kelsey Siebel in the Woodlands. The CDC is being sued by 10,000 doctors and 1,000 lawyers for falsifying their facts about COVID-19 and the jabs. You are the board, in my opinion, and in many people that I've spoken to, have made some poor decisions for the children. You are all elected. No, you are, that, that is the exception. <laughs> you um, have been in office since 2016, but based on the decisions that you make going forward, there's, we can make a petition for you to, to exit. I would also like everyone here to know that in November 2022, Mr. Inman, Mr. Sanders, and Hubert will be up for re-election. Mr. Williams, Mr. Wagman, Mrs. Chase, and Mr. Moore will be up in 2024. Please make the decisions for the children that they can best be educated on our history and without masks. Thank you. Susan Scruggs. Susan Scruggs. Good evening. Um, I have noticed that a CISD has partnered with Kelsey Seabull to administer vaccines for ages 12 to 17 and or 12 to 15 and older. I wanted to bring some information to you that um, some statistics about this. And I think you have put yourself in a very risky situation for this. I think it was a very poor decision. The data I'm going to give you is uh, from a reporting site for COVID vaccine adverse events hosted by the CDC. It's called VAERS, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It is updated weekly and it reports deaths, adverse events, serious injuries from the COVID vaccine. Please listen carefully. From December 13th to 2020 until June 4th, 2021, the data from the CDC shows as follows. 329,021 adverse events from the COVID vaccine. 5,888 deaths from the COVID vaccine. 28,441 serious injuries from the COVID vaccine vaccine. Now there have also been reports of females having uh, excess bleeding, irregular menstrual cycles, infertility, miscarriages uh, in older females. Uh, there was a report of one baby dying after breastfeeding with her mother and she had recently had the COVID jab. And these statistics being reported by physicians uh, are all, they are saying that this is only 1% in the VAR system of the adverse events, 1%. Now from the, this week, or the June 4th to the week before, there was a 3,082 increase of, uh, from the prior week of adverse events. 
There is no responsibility from the physicians or the medical entities to take any responsibility for any of the adverse events. Why? Because it's emergency use authorization. It has not gone through phase one, phase two, phase three of trials. It does not have a package insert, which is a legal binding document for the pharmaceutical companies. Therefore, you cannot sue a pharmaceutical company for an EUA um, drug. And it's not really a vaccine. It does not immunize you against COVID. It lessens the symptoms of COVID. They say you can still spread COVID. You can still contract COVID. Thank you. I appreciate it. Joseph you. Blue. Could you say the name one more time? I'm sorry, Joseph Liu. <clears throat> Before I begin, I just want to say this is I totally ad lib, that I would like to express my unequivocal opposition to the teaching of CRT in our schools, okay? I just believe the school should be taught the three R's, and R's does not include uh, race theory. So I just want to express my, my unequivocal opposition to the teaching of CRT in our school. That should be totally out of our school system. Now, actually, the reason I'm here, thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank the school board and President Hubert for the opportunity to express my concerns about the lack of action of the school district administration to a problem that has received much national attention over the past several months. This issue is hate and discrimination against Asian Americans. My name is Joe Liu. I'm a physician. I have been a resident of Conroe ISD for 26 years. I have two children who attend schools in Conroe ISD, including a son who will start seventh grade this coming fall. For well, those of you who don't remember me, I was here last month to talk to you about what appears to be a racist and discriminatory uh, action against my son in favor of another student of a different color by his orchestra teacher, Ms. Alicia Gibbs, at Collins Intermediate School. I've requested to talk to Ms. Gibbs on three separate occasions, and I've been refused each and every time. This is against the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is a federal law that, quote, guarantees parent-teacher conferences and reasonable access to staff, unquote. I have therefore filed a complaint with the Office of ESSA Compliance through the Texas Education Agency. Uh, in addition, I've also submitted a complaint to the office with the Office for Civil Rights of the United States Department of Education due to my concerns about racism and discrimination in my son's case. What is so ironic about this episode is this incident occurred in May, which just so happened to be Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Remember, all that I'm asking for is my rights under the law to meet with my son's teacher. I just don't understand why this has been so difficult and why, I, and why I have to appear before the school board for such a simple request. By this teacher's continued attempts to avoid talking to me, even though this is against the law, I am left to wonder what other nefarious reasons, in addition to discrimination, is she guilty of? And equally, why is the school administration and the school board protecting her? I doubt that anybody in the school board cares about my concerns because I'm still not allowed to meet with my son's teacher. However, my son has volunteered to pre present his victim's impact statement directly to you at the July school board meeting. How much time do I have? 30, 30, 35 seconds? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, since I have a little bit of time, I just want, I, mean, I don't want to appear like I'm a sour grape or a sour apple. I do want to express my support and my, and, and my adulation for the school board and the school staff and the school administration for keeping Conroe ISD open this past school year. Uh, I know that a lot of school, schools had, had, had to be closed and Conroe ISD is one of the few school districts that, that stayed open. I do appreciate that and I do commend the school, the school district for that. And, and, and uh, for that, I want to thank the school board again for its time and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Paola Silva. Good afternoon. So thanks to the partnership that you have created with a local clinic, on May 28th, you sent out an email promoting your students, our kids, to get the COVID vaccine, as if that were a great opportunity for them. Today, I want to present some science-based facts that show that not only do they not need this so-called vaccine, but they could put themselves at risk with some potential serious long-term medical issues promoted by this shot. 
and the fact that we are going to present our collection from many pediatricians that have given their voluntary speech on their oath to many different Texas legislations and have been interviewed on many alternative news media since their voice and concerns have been silenced from mass media, again as a manifestation of the immense censorship that this topic has created. Even when most of the facts are being extracted from peer-reviewed scientific articles. So I'm going to share some science-based facts that you should have told your students or told us as parents instead of inviting us to risk our kids participating in this experimental shot. And yes, the correct term is experimental and because as we have heard in many occasions, emergency approval just means that it is experimental. And it's even when it's very difficult to believe, but in this case, the safety data is being collected and recorded for analysis after human vaccination has been administrated. So because of this unique situation, the only honest truth about this so-called vaccine is that there are many blind spots, many questions without answers, and much unbased information, because there hasn't been any enough time to perform the needed long-term studies. So you should um, have take, uh, taken a more safety approach by telling your students to wait and be more precautious on the vaccine because one, they have 99.997% chance to recover from the virus. So they have just 0.003% risk of death from the virus. They are not virus spreaders. In contracts, they are buffers. There hasn't even there hasn't even one case of a school transmission hotspot. They are not putting on risk their grandparents nor the vulnerable population around them because actually it works the opposite way. Studies, ha studies have shown that they block the virus from getting to their loved ones because they are a natural barrier for, for the virus. Their immune system is strong and smart enough to fight the virus and eliminate or kill it that is why they don't get sick at the, and they do not transfer the virus, basically because the virus cannot reproduce on their system. So this is not a vaccine, this is a genetic experimental show. So we have been, we have been uh, shown that uh, we have many reports, especially on young people, for several myocarditis reports. Appreciate your time, thank you very much. Alex, Alex Silva. I'm going to be speaking for Alex Silva. Sure. Okay, please state your name so I can have your name. Yes, my name is Kathy Losetta. Um, and I'm picking up where, um, okay, where um, pa Paolo left off. Uh, there, as you heard from many of the folks, there are many, uh, there are several inflammation of the heart issues with young children that are young teens that are getting this uh, experimental um, jab. Health authorities know about the spike proteins, that they produce cardiac damage and microvascular damage. The mRNA is a super, is, is a super antibot, antibody reaction. The animals that were tested on a previous vaccine died, and so that's how come they didn't even bother going through the experimental. They had to make it experimental, otherwise uh, they couldn't get it through. So we're, we're experimenting on our kids, and, and some of us are experimenting on ourselves. I mean, I, I'm not doing that. Uh, pediatricians that were up until now pro-vaccine are very suspicious because the so-called vaccine, a lot of things are being silenced. For instance, the rotavirus vaccines were halted after 15 cases of reported adverse reactions, just 15. I mean, what, what you've heard here is m much more than that. So why is that? The swine flu vaccine back in the 70s when I was growing up was halted after 25 deaths. Now we have 5,000. And this, this VARES system is a voluntary reporting system. So if they only have 5,000, can you imagine how many we're not hearing about? It's voluntary. They don't have to do that. So instead of selling our kids the idea that getting this jab is a great opportunity for them, you should take this pandemic as an opportunity to teach them about the importance of taking care of their health, their immune system, creating healthy habits and lifestyles. But instead, the, the board, or I'm not sure who chose to uh, advertise this, uh, this um, 
experimental uh, jab at Kelsey Siebold, but instead uh, you chose to replicate and increase the fare, the fare among them, and not even once you taught them how to get strong so we could quickly get rid of this virus. And I've got a few more seconds, and I'd like to talk to you about the PCR test. The PCR test was invented by Kerry uh, uh, Nullis. He was a real brainy guy, uh, and he told Dr. Fauci that the PCR test could give you any result you wanted. Look it up. I'm not making this up. He, th this test was for development. What was for developing things, not for diagnosing anything. What we have, we, we don't have a, a pandemic. We have a, a, a PCR fake test demic. This is all a big fake. We're soon going to find out. I'm very sorry at the decisions we've all made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Charlie Patterson. Mr. Hubert, members of the board, Dr. No. thank you for the privilege of being here tonight to speak to you on behalf of Janet Bartlett. It is my honor to stand before you and do that. You have seen and read Janet's bio and service history with CISD for 30 years. I'm here to remind us why this process is so important. I have some questions for you to consider. What is the hope and purpose of a school? For kids to learn and grow and become successful. Who delivers the most impact within a campus every day with every child? classroom teacher. As a leader of the CISD, what qualities do you want most in a classroom teacher? Here are some core qualities of a classroom teacher I value most as a retired educator. Lifelong commitment to learning, allowing each child to grow and to develop to their fullest potential, strong character, evidenced by integrity, excellence, and service-minded, loving, compassionate, encouraging heart for children. That's Janet Bartlett. As you continue to reflect and choose who will have their name put on the bricks and mortar within CISD, please remember the core mission and the purpose of every school. Remember the heart and soul of every campus. It's the teacher, the classroom teacher. Our school district is blessed with many, many qualified individuals for this honor. I realize the awesome responsibility that you have when you name a building. On behalf of the Bartlett family, it is my honor and pleasure to recommend my friend and longtime long CISD teacher, Janet Bartlett, to be chosen as a namesake for the new CISD Flex School 21. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Christy Swoboda. President Hubert, Dr. Knoll, and members of the board, my name is Christy Swoboda, and I am a former CISD employee part-time. I come to you to advocate for other part-time employees who are enrolled in the district's health insurance plan. As a part-time employee, I was required to pay 50% of the district's contribution for my policy. I would like you to know that my biweekly health insurance deduction was $205.50, 
out of my standard pay of $377.44. My portion of the district repayment was more than my insurance premium. More than half of my paycheck went to insurance coverage and that was just for me. TRS, Medicare, eye insurance, life insurance, accidental death and disability it subtracted even more. My June 15th, today's paycheck was $126.57. Please consider changing the policy of requiring part-time employees to pay back the remainder of the district contribution because for me that was that would have made a big difference. And I know for other people it does too. It's very hard when you go in and you work and you come back and you find out that for the year you have made $3,400 for the entire year. Um, I love my job. I love working for the district. I don't love paying back the insurance premiums. So I know it's not on, on the agenda nothing to be considered but when it comes time for this to come up in discussion again please consider it thank you thank you mr Woboda. glenna sloan glenna sloan thank you for this opportunity to speak to you in regard to critical race theory I'm a 77-year-old white woman. I've lived in numerous states. Two of them were Arkansas and Florida. In Arkansas and Florida, numerous racially motivated massacres and attacks occurred. I learned this history only very recently. Our own Montgomery County has had its share of, of racially motivated killings that have been swept under the rug. These things ought not so to be. Critical race theory is an academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists in the United States who seek to critically examine the law as it intersects with issues of race and to challenge mainstream liberal approaches to racial justice. It examines social, cultural, cultural and legal issues as they relate to race and racism. The theory is loosely unified by two common themes. Number one, that white supremacy or societal racism does exist and maintains power through law. And number two, that transforming the relationship between law and racial power and also achieving racial emancipation and anti-subordination more broadly are possible. House Bill 3979 targets, targets the theory and would bar teachers from discussing some of its core tenets including the existence of white privilege and systemic racism. I want our teachers to have the freedom to teach my grandchildren the depth of embedded racism in our country. Thomas Jefferson is only one example. He wrote, all men are created equal while owning over 100 black slaves and having children by one of them, a now undeniable fact proven by DNA testing and uncovered by our own Conroe ISD alumnus Annette Gordon-Reed in 1997, although though the truth had been known and hotly contested for 200 years. Critical race theory has nothing to do with blame or guilt, but has everything to do with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I am personally furious that our racial history has been suppressed. I do not want it to continue into the next generation. Comprehensive truth must be known to correctly understand our whole history and to set us free from its deliberate and poisonous redactions. Thank you. Thank you. Greg McDonald. Thank you all for this opportunity to speak <coughs> to a subject that I believe to be of penultimate importance. My name is Greg McDonald. I'm a resident of Conroe and a retired pastor of 31 years with a degree in psychology and a master's degree. I want to take a little different approach to this important issue of CRT. With years of counseling experience in family systems, one thing I have learned is this. 
if a family is in conflict, it'll never, ever, ever be resolved without honest and truthful sharing of the family's history. Anything short of that is meaningless denial and dis sure destruction of the family. Our very American family is in real trouble. I think almost all of us here would say that's true. So let me say this. I am 74 years old and I have just, just now come to this awareness. I'm ashamed and I'm appalled that it has taken me this long. I want to ask each of you a question, maybe for all of us here tonight. And I'd ask that you would answer it in your hearts with truthfulness and honesty. Did you learn in school about the Tulsa massacre in 1921 and the many other massacres that took place in many cities in our country? I didn't. But now a second question. I, I think one that is of more importance. I think we all should ask ourselves, if we didn't, why did I not learn that? To ask that question and seek answers would be to exercise critical thinking. Critical thinking about the systemic racism that has plagued our American family to this very day. It seems to me that if one did not ask that question, then one is either lacking in critical thinking or they just don't care. I cannot imagine any educator falling into one of these two categories. We simply cannot say that to talk about racism would bring about division. The fact is that we've got great division right now and we're not talking about it. We can and we must do better for our children. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. John Wirtz. Hey, John. Sure. Good evening, Mr. President, board, and Dr. Knoll. I'm John Wirtz of the Woodlands. On behalf of a grateful nation, these are the words from the preamble that accompanies the handing of an American flag into the waiting, often trembling arms of grieving loved one is a powerful symbol. It seeks to convey a shared sense of sacrifice on behalf of the military, the fallen service member, and the family. This relationship is inextricably forged within the covenant of duty to country. Both the flag folding and the utterance of these words are done with exact precision. I've witnessed several of these presentations at funeral services. I prayed that with our son deployed to Afghanistan years ago, we'd never have to experience this most moving of ceremonies. At the same time, I wondered, did this spoken tradition of military decorum bring comfort or distress? Did it bring consolation for the whole left within their family? Did it align their grief with a sense of honor did the mourning family even believe them that in fact a nation was aware of the sacrifice being honored? Over time, life, life takes it back over and most of us move on. However, it's tough for the family to move on. In fact, it's something that families never really get over. The picture I just distributed to you was of the graveside services of Brandon Smitherman of Conroe. He and a colleague were killed by an IED attack in Iraq in 2007 as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Like Brandon, my son, and many others before him that served, they served in harm's way to protect us. Service, duty, country. These are the bonds that tie these heroes together that put their lives on the line for us, and unfortunately for some, to make that dreaded ultimate sacrifice. 
My understanding is that the board is looking for names to grace either the new Caney Creek Junior High Schools in the district. None could be more fitting than the name Veterans Memorial. We owe it to their Gold Star families, we owe it to our country, and to our county in memory of their sacrifices. Mostly, we owe it to those who sacrifice all on behalf of a grateful nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Very good. That concludes our um, citizen participation. If those of you would like to leave, this is certainly a time. You're more than welcome to stay with us all night if you want to. But if you don't Mr. want to. Mr. Hubert, you... someone is standing. I did sign up. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't get your sign up. on. Did you sign up online? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Come on up. Go ahead. Yeah, please. If you'll just state your name so I have Cynthia it. Cynthia Sizelove. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. And with respect, I want to say to you, I'm not going to thank you for listening to me because I believe it's your obligation and it's your duty when sitting in those seats. Sure. Um, and also, I want to preface by saying we have all reached out to you and said that we would like to round table with you and we would like to work hand in hand to fix the problems within our school community. I have yet to hear any invitation to do so, and I do demand, and I am you choosing that word, that we get together and discuss these things. We want to hear your feedback from this. This is not a therapy session for us parents. Um, I want to start by saying that you didn't mention in your email or any other communication form facts that could be beneficial to every single one of our students in regards to this, uh, what they call the vaccine, which is not a vaccine. By teaching things like to the students such as support their immune system by adapting healthy habits, reduce sugar, toxins, intake and exposure and screen time, spend more time outdoors in natural environments, eat a whole high high in nutrients natural diet and leave junk food and soda for the occasional assumption consumption stay active enjoy a hobby smile hug socialize more and be with loved ones grow your faith and to know that fear stress and isolation lack of oxygen as well and one of the most harmful things to your immune system so school board what is your rush to get these kids vaccinated? If you believe in the efficacy of this so-called vaccines and your teachers and staff have already been vaccinated, what is your urgency? Why are you partnering with clinics to give experimental jabs instead of partnering with holistic doctors to teach kids how to get stronger immune systems, how to have healthy lifestyles? After all, this is way more important than any of other curriculum. Why are you not sending these truths to our children? During the whole pandemic, you have always said that safety of our kids is your priority. You are aware that there are no safety studies, or are you aware that there are no safety studies, and I think that you are, of this so-called vaccine. To be clear, the clinical trials run for only three months. If we, we would like you to know it is a fact that this is the first time in medical history a safety data and known side effects are being compiled after vaccinations instead of the standard before injections are given to the population. Our children are not lab rats. And you cannot allow the schools to do so. I have 17 seconds, so I will move along and I will put you all on notice. It is against the law to give medical advice. You should not be partnering with these clinics with this experimental drug or uh, whatever it is, and also I will tell you, it will be on all of you, and one day in the beyond, you will answer for your behavior. Thank you very much, and good evening. Yeah. Is there anybody else that we may have missed by chance? Um, I wasn't able to sign up. No. Mm -mm. You can't do that. You, do you that. have to you sign can't. it before the meeting. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. We have to. We have to move on. Okay. Moving on to our next agenda, our consent agenda is uh, item four. Consent agenda. Uh, uh, motion to accept the consent agenda as presented, uh, Mr. President. Second. All right. A motion and a second. Any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. Do it. Yes, everybody's good. 
Yeah, I think we're just going to push on through the, through the meeting. All right, item 4A, discuss possible names for new Conroe ISD campus and facilities, Dr. Knoll. All right, Ms. Blakelock's going to make the presentation. I, I would just like to add before she makes her presentation, it's, this is sort of a special evening. This doesn't happen uh, often, but we have three school namesakes in the room tonight. And so I would just like to honor them. Mr. Charlie Patterson, who we heard from earlier, Patterson Elementary. We have Dr. Jean Stewart, namesake of Stewart Elementary. And Ms. Kathy Clark for Clark Intermediate. It's, this is quite an honor to have you all here, so thank you. Good job. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to join you again to help facilitate this naming process. And so tonight I come before you, um, and I'm going to help work through five items. So the first item is a discussion item during which you will discuss potential names for the four facilities you see on the screen. The first facility. Um, on your agenda that you'll uh, be presented with is the Teacher Training Center. It's in the top center of the screen. The next facility is the new Caney Creek Junior High, which is the top left. Then it will be the current Caney, C Caney Creek Junior High, the top right. And then finally the new elementary in the Conroe Feeder, which is the bottom left. And so um, this naming process is outlined in Board Policy CW Local. And so with that, President Hubert, I turn the discussion item over to you. Very good. Do you by chance have the names, the, the list of names that were, um, that were provided over the if internet? You, it's on the website. If you yeah, give on me the website. one that's, moment. That's all I meant. I, we, I, we all have it, but okay, I didn't know yes. if you had the ability to. Would you like for me to pull them up for you? Um, sure, I think that'd be, that'd be helpful. I can, can absolutely do that. I, let me grab the presentation from last month. Sure. Um, and just to remind our viewing audience, um, the board can, <laughs> can select any name, whether or not it was submitted through the right. website. So just one moment, let me grab that for you. Okay. While she's doing that, I'm, we can um, entertain the <coughs> idea of, of any, any names or how we would like to go through this. Do you mind if I go ahead and proceed? I, I do not, please. All right, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, being on a school board, I think this is the hardest thing we do. You know, we vote for a 600, almost $600 million budget, and uh, we do that faster and easier sometimes, although we have plenty of board workshops about it, uh, but about naming schools. Um, as a son of an educator, it's an honor to name any school after someone who has dedicated their life to uh, such a great and honorable profession. Uh, I have four kind of names that I would like to submit, consider, and I'll be glad to listen to everyone. The first one, as we talked about, is we sold the Walter Jett Center to the city of Conroe, and they're going to turn it into a great fine arts facility for Conroe, and it'll be awesome. But I don't, I don't want Mr. Walter Jett's name to go away, and so I would love if we could transfer the... Uh, the Walter Jett Learning Center to the new uh, facility there at the north end of the Wood Forest Stadium. The next one is the naming of the junior high. And I know that, you know, we don't have to do what past boards have done, but past boards have, uh, we had, we moved a, a, a Pete junior high here in Conroe, which is now the ninth grade campus for Conroe High School. And Dr. Pete had that name moved over to the new Pete junior high school. And I feel like it would probably be appropriate to leave Mr. Albert L. Moorhead Junior High the same as the naming for the new uh, high school in the Caney Creek feeder zone. But that leaves an opening for the current Moorhead Junior High. And as Mr. Wirtz said, and, and Mr. Wirtz, I, I admire what you said, and I am right there with you. We have so many veterans in Conroe and Montgomery County that have given their life for our nation and for our freedom and for our victory. And, and uh, I would love if we could name the intermediate school, which is currently the Albert L. Moorhead Junior High, which will return to being an intermediate school, to name it Veterans Memorial Intermediate. I believe that uh, the Caney Creek Feeder Zone, probably every year when they have graduates, more people 
in that feeder zone and that, that graduating class at Candy Creek High School attend military uh, and, and enlist and enroll in the military. And so I think it would be a great honor for that one as well. And then that leaves a brand new uh, elementary school. And as was presented tonight, there's so many great teachers out there. But there's one that comes to mind. Uh, her family is from Conroe. She was a teacher of the year for Conroe ISD. She's a Sam Houston graduate. Uh, she supported the school. She was a teacher for over 30 years. She was a substitute for 10 years after she retired as a teacher. Um, she's got a son who became an Eagle Scout and his Eagle Scout project was to put a flower bed in next to the Conroe Tiger across the street here at Conroe High School. And while he's completed that Eagle Scout project, he continues to this day to go and make sure that there are flowers there by the Conroe Tiger. So I feel like it would be appropriate to name the new elementary school the Janet K. Bartlett Elementary School. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. Sanders. Would anybody else like to entertain some thoughts or ideas? Did you have them? I can show whichever names you would like. Just let me know, and I can put any of the stuff there when you're ready. Okay, I'll let you know. Mr. Morgan. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with, <laughs> with everything that, that uh, Mr. Sanders has said, and, and um, I agree that, that um, Ms. Bartlett's name would be, would be fabulous for that elementary school, but I would like us to consider another one for that school. Um, I have nothing to add to his previous three, but um, Dr. Annette Gordon-Reed has um, been considered several times by previous boards. Uh, she is a, a Conroe native and has gone on to do some amazing things and represent this community very well. Um, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Harvard professor, um, just an absolutely amazing woman. And I think um, that she definitely deserves um, consideration for the naming of the new elementary school. Any other thoughts on them? The other three, I'm in complete agreement with Mr. Um, Sanders. Similarly, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything Mr. Sanders said, with the exception of um, I would like to offer Ms. Reed also for the elementary school. Uh, Ms. Reed is a Harvard professor. She's a Pulitzer Prize um, author, winning author. She's won over 16 book awards. Um, she's a Conroe High graduate. Um, she has done amazing things on the national level for as far as representing our, our city, our school district, as well as our state. Um, more recently, in 2017, Conroe City Council uh, has voted unanimously to allow the bus to, of Ms. Ms. Reed uh, to be added to Founders Plaza next to uh, the Owens uh, Theater downtown Conroe uh, for her work in, in the literacy, I'm sorry, literacy, the literature and higher education field. She is an outstanding young lady, a product of Conroe ISD, and I, I believe that honoring Ms. Reed uh, with the school namesake uh, would spotlight literature, uh, would bring hope and inspiration to our stu the students of CISD, and just continue to follow along with the legacy of naming our, our schools, our school sakes, after outstanding Conroe ISD graduates, residents, as well as educators. Her, she'd been an educator herself, a professor at Harvard, which is, which is a phenomenal, a, a feat of, of, of beyond uh, imagined for some of our students in CISD. So my, my proposal would be for the elementary to be named Ms. Uh, Annette Gordon-Reed Elementary. Stacy. Yes, um, I just would like to say um, I'm happy to hear that most of us are in agreement with um, retaining the Jet Center naming. That was important to me, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, I do not have another name to offer. Okay. Any thoughts on the other other schools other than the elementary school, like the um, the junior high? You know, you're okay with, yes. with those as yes. well. Yes. Ms. Wagman, do you have anything to add as well? I do. I have one more, uh, one more name to mention um, for either the elementary school or the junior high school. Um, Ms. Barbara Cargill, who has been known here in Montgomery County for many years. She was a science teacher. 
and also did some fantastic summer camps, science summer camps in the woodlands. And she has also served for the last 14 years as our representative for the state school board. And so I would like to offer her name for either one of those um, campuses. I think that her enthusiasm <laughs> for science and learning and making science fun would be a huge asset to either one of those campuses. So I hope you'll think about her. Yeah, and then, the, of course, the rest of the suggestions, um, each and every one, very, very quality, quality names, quality candidates. Agreed. Dr. Noel, would you mind sharing with us some, some thoughts from Mr. Inman? I yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. Mr. Inman couldn't be here tonight, but I did ask him just if he, if there were any, if he had strong feelings he'd like me to share, just the understanding he, he won't have a vote tonight, but he did want me to express that he had uh, strong feelings about the JET name moving over, and he also um, believes very strongly in, in support of a Veterans Memorial for the yeah. intermediate school. So those, those were the, his two thoughts if you just would like to share. Okay, very good. So then there's then there's me. Dr. Noel, could we add like 50 more schools or buildings? Yeah, right. <laughs> in, due, in due time. <laughs> we'll all make it. Yeah, no, I, I, Mr. Sanders hits an nail on the head. Um, when I first got to the board seven years ago, I think it was Mr. Sanders or um, somebody else on the board said, it's a cakewalk until you have to name a school <laughs> because there's there's so many and i say that term loosely it's not a cakewalk but it's it it is something that we take very serious and there's a lot of great people in this community and this community is getting even bigger and bigger some great names i would like to add an additional name for consideration as, as also um dr uh, joanne bacon as well who has served in this community for a long time uh, has a lot of accolades and and meant a lot especially to our our students who are at hawk as now Washington as well. Um, I like the idea as well as um, moving the Walter Jet Center, the transferring that name over as well. I think that, that seems to make sense to me as well. Um, and the Moorhead name. I like the idea of the Veterans Memorial as well. I think that's a great way for us to, to salute and honor our fallen um, heroes and military people. Um, so I like that as well. And then the elementary schools have been great nominations as well. Do we have any other conversation about this? Would anybody like to see the list? Um, I, I think we probably don't need to. <laughs> I'll ask you to do something. That's I'm sorry. Fine. I'll, I'll this presentation him. will work for the I'll next board items times. as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so moving on to item uh, 5B, consider a name for the teacher training center. Do I? have a motion for that. Mr. President, I motion that we name the Teacher Training Center, the Walt Jet Training Center. Is that how we want to word it? Walter. Walter. Walter, Walter, Walter Jet. Um, Walter Jet we can, Training We can play with the, the middle vernacular there, but if Walter yeah. Jet is the namesake, then we can Sounds have good. the official title. So that's my motion. I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? Raise your hand. All those opposed, the same sign? Seeing none, very good, and passes. And I will just say a thank you on behalf of the Jet family. I know that you know, when we sold the building a few years ago, I had conversations with Mr. Jet, and I know it was a concern of the family that his legacy would be lost, and I know this will mean the world to them. So thank you all for that. Yeah. All right, item four, uh, 5C, consider name of junior high considered name of new junior high in the Caney Creek feeder zone. So I'm understanding this is the new, not the existing. Correct. This is the new junior high. <laughs> Mr. President, I nominate Albert L. Moorhead junior high as the name of the new junior high. All right. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, raise a hand. Any opposed by the same sign? All right, motion carries. Very good. Yes. Okay, item D, consider name of current junior high in the Caney Creek feeder zone, which is the intermediate. Well, now it will become an intermediate. Yes, now sir. become the intermediate. Okay. Mr. President, I would move we name the new intermediate school the Veterans Memorial Intermediate School. Second the motion. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any other thoughts? All right. All those in favor, uplifted hand. All those opposed, 
on the same side. Okay, motion carries. Congratulations. That's a very honorable thing to do. Very nice. Okay, um, item 5E, consider name of new elementary in the Conroe feeder zone. Mr. I'd, President. Oh, go ahead. Mr. President, I want a motion that we name it um, Annette Gordon Reed Elementary. I would second the motion. Point of order. Yes, sir. So we're nominating, right? Yeah. So I could also nominate someone else. Yes. And then we would just vote on each name. Is that correct? I agree. No, what we have to do is if we have a motion and a second, we discuss that motion and then we vote on that motion. Mr. We President, can make an amendment. I would like to say I, I don't want who's first up to the podium to kind of right. dictate That's it. That's right. That's the point I, of what we're trying to make. Yeah. multiple okay. options and we I, vote I think we need to do that. it as a nomination since we do have okay. several and that's why I'm just I, I understand you know I what agree. we can do under the rules of order I believe that we can nominate and then we can vote on the nominations in whichever nomination receives the most votes agree the victory. would we like to move that to a silent I, I, I would I would reject my motion and form it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way of a nomination as opposed so that we can allow for multiples and then we can okay. vote whoever gets the most votes. So you're re removing your motion? Yes. So we need to have a second for the removal of the motion. Well, whoever seconded would oh, have to remove that. If, if, I mean, I, I want to make sure we do that in order and fair okay. and fairness. Absolutely. So that's, that's the way we want to do you it. You guys are making Let's... me go back on my parliamentary <laughs> procedure. <laughs> no, I, your FFA you know, manual, we've uh, been down Peter. This, <laughs> we've been down this path, mo path multiple times I and I want to make sure. Wow, as vice president of FFA. There you go. You got it. So, okay. So we've, we have no nomination on, on this agenda item. We do not have a nomination. So how would we like to handle this as a, as a group? Would I guess like the majority of votes. Mm -hmm. You want to go ahead and make your nomination? So my nomination was Ms. Lynette Gordon Reed, Elementary. Okay. Okay. Mr. President, I nominate Janet K. Bartlett. Okay. So. Oh, and I'd yes. like to nominate Barbara Cargill Elementary. Okay. okay. Any other nominations? Okay, so we can move that to a vote. Ms. Glass, you can help me with this. Can we do this as a silent, you know? I don't think so. Our no. vote has to be public. No, it's gotta be public. I'm, Everyone has to see and know mm -hmm. how, you, how we voted. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then I'll just I'll call the vote. So those in favor for um, Annette Gordon Reed Elementary, all those in favor of that? Okay, we have three. All right, all those in favor of Barbara Cargill, one, okay. And all of those in favor of Janet K. Bartlett, we have two, okay. So, all right, so that motion. Motion carries for Annette, Annette Gordon-Reed for the new elementary school. So, okay, very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. We pr appreciate everybody working, working through that. Like I said, this is not the, it, it's tough. It's tough. It's great, great names, great people out there and love this community. And, and there will be other schools and other, other uh, buildings in the future. Item 5F. Consider Mr. Hubert, if you hang on one second, I think Ms. Wagner had a question. Of us. make sure we get, oh, okay. we, we have it properly done. So I just wanted to make sure on when we had placed a nomination, shouldn't we have voted as a group up or down on each individual nomination versus uh -huh. split it all up? Well, that's what we're trying to avoid. Well, that's in fact what we did. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Well, no, because we only got since we only got one vote there could have been multiple people that would have voted for a secondary or a third candidate um instead of instead of just reserving their one vote between three okay i think you bring up another point um Ms. We, Gladys. I, I am not a Roberts Rule expert. Where is Mel Brown when we need him? Yeah, right. Yeah. Somebody come yeah. under yeah. Mel Brown in the room. Well, so. well properly, you, you, the problem is if you resort back, if we revert back to where we were, we'd have to entertain my motion to nominate, have discussion, and either vote yay or nay. We got a second, so you have discussion, then you have to vote on that. Um, and, and that's one way. The other way is. The other way was the way we did. That way everyone would have an opportunity to present their candidate and everyone would get to vote as opposed to the first person up. We have to vote against folks. Mm -hmm. Would you, uh, let me ask you, 
would you want to have t tell me what you'd like to do would, would you see it as voting twice like well we had since we had three nominations mm -hmm. it I think that each nomination should be voted up or down versus spread out all of the votes across for for just one one candidate one nomination well we I think the way I called the vote was those in favor of, and you have the opportunity to be in favor of that. But only one time. Not, sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, it could have been that multiple people would have voted for one of the other candidates, and then you would have gone to the second one, and they may have they may have not had the same amount well, of votes. Yeah. No, I, I think I understand that, but it wouldn't have worked. It would have voted for Miss Free three up. And you, you had your candidate it would have passed. I mean, you, you, you'd have voted. I mean, how would that have worked? I'm still struggling to understand it. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand. Well, I mean, if if that's, I mean, if that's the way that we're going to do it, I just, it just seems like each each candidate should have been voted for as a whole board versus just an individual. But that's how we did it, though. That's what I'm saying. Is you, you well, know. And we, that's we, fine. We rescinded I've, the motion I have, to do it. I that have way. made my point. All right. okay. <laughs> that's all. I, I just would have liked to have seen that. But you're right. Then it would have been first out whoever got their nomination out. Um, we try to avoid. That, yeah, that was the vote that w the motion that was rescinded to do it. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You okay. good? Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Item five F. Consider approval of. Interlocal agreement in the Montgomery County Emergency Communication District for 911 call talking. All right, Captain Blakelock, our great Conroe ISD Police Department. He's working his way around. Good evening, no President three. Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Null. I am very happy to be presenting tonight and asking for your approval of an interlocal agreement between Montgomery County Emergency Communication District, which I'll refer to as Montgomery County 911, uh, and Conroe ISD to designate Conroe ISD Police Department Dispatch as a secondary 911 PSAP in Montgomery County. With us tonight from Montgomery County 911 are the Executive Director, Chip Van Steenberg, and Associate Director, Andrea Wilson. First question you're gonna have is what is a PSAP? A PSAP is a public safety answering point. When anyone in Montgomery County dials 911, it's gonna to go to a primary PSAP in Montgomery County. Currently, there's two, which happen to be the two largest law enforcement agencies in the county, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office and Conroe Police Department. They will be the ones to answer that 911 call. They will either handle that call or they will transfer it to a secondary PSAP. In Montgomery County right now, Montgomery County Hospital District EMS and the Woodlands Township Fire Department are secondary PSAPs. We've had this discussion with Montgomery County 911 for several years, um, and this last year, we've done a lot of research and studying, and we've gotten to the point where Montgomery County 911 has asked Conroe ISD Police Department to become a secondary PSAP. We are the third largest law enforcement agency in Montgomery County. Uh, we are one of the few agencies that has a 24-7 emergency dispatch center with a lot of the infrastructure needed um, to support being a PSAP. And we are, our schools and facilities are, you know, we span over 348 square miles, and on any given day, we could have 80,000 people at our facilities. Uh, and we interact with 911 multiple times each day, at least six times on average each day. So what do we receive by becoming a 911 PSAP? Um, one, we will not be the primary call taker for 911 calls. We will have the ability to transfer 911 to our agency from another 911 agency or vice versa. Uh, if you approve this agreement tonight, 911 has agreed to provide all of the equipment, the installation, and the ongoing maintenance at their cost. We receive numerous services that we don't currently have the capability of right now. Um, some of those are automatic number and location information for 911 callers. Uh, we will receive uh, profile data for Smart 911 and RAVE facility. Smart 911, any resident in Montgomery County can go in and create a profile through a program uh, run by Montgomery County 911. 
and they can put in emergency information should they ever have to call 911 and we have to respond to their home. We've got that information built into the system before we even arrive. Uh, Ray facility is similar. It's for entities and organizations to be able to build a profile and enter their emergency contact information, their building floor plans, and other, again, emergency information to have at our fingertips prior to needing it. Uh, and matter of fact, Conroe ISD creates a RAVE facility profile for 911 for every one of our facilities. So, uh, and currently we don't have access to that um, <coughs> ourselves. So, uh, we will also receive the, a telecommunication device for the deaf to be able to communicate with those deaf or hard of hearing and a language line for interpretation services. We will receive text to 911 capability, which we currently don't have. And we will get uh, space over at Montgomery County 911 as an emergency backup location. Should something ever occur that we had to evacuate the police department, we will have a preset dispatch center set up for our dispatchers to maintain their operations. And they're less than one mile away from us. And then we get uh, all the analytics that come with it that we don't currently have. Uh, being able to uh, run reports, pull data on 911 calls to help us allocate our resources and uh, respond better. So what, what we get from this agreement is uh, reduced call taking times and faster response, uh, much better information sharing between emergency response agencies, um, and that's better service to our customers, to our citizens. So CISD, our community, and our citizens are gonna benefit from this. Um, Conroe ISD Police Department, 911, and other emergency response agencies in Montgomery County will benefit. And it's going to strengthen an already great working relationship that we have with our other emergency responders in the county. Uh, Montgomery County 911 has agreed to bear the cost of the equipment, the installation, um, ongoing maintenance, and the training of our dispatchers. And they approved this interlocal agreement on May 19th at their regular board meeting. With that, I'll say thank you. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have and then ask for your approval of the interlocal agreement. Entertain a motion. Mr. President, I'd move for approval of the interlocal agreement. All right, we have a motion. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or conversation? Yes. <laughs> can you educate me, Captain Blakelock? I can what try. The Montgomery County Emergency Communications District, you said they just had a board meeting. I'm not familiar with that. I'm familiar with emergency services districts that provide fire, fire services. Can you help just, ed I mean, is this district just provides 911 services Montgomery and if so county. how is it created i mean are they i know like esds the county commissioners appoint <coughs> the board members for the esds who how, i'm just not familiar with this so it, it is very similar i think that that might be best answered governed? by the executive I mean, director reason oh good good i'd love to i just want to learn i, I i'm just i'm ignorant so i appreciate it chip thank, thank you. you no thank you for the opportunity uh Emergency communication districts, well, there's 27 of them across the state of Texas. They operate under Chapter 772 of the Public Health and Safety Code. Uh, it was created by the voters of Montgomery County back in the late 1980s. Uh, we are governed by a five-member board. Two members are appointed by all the cities in the, in the county. They, they jointly elect two board members. Two board members are appointed by the Montgomery County um, Commissioner's Court and what board member is appointed by the fire chiefs of the county. Okay, all right, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. You're welcome. And, and revenue from, how, how do they receive revenue? We're funded by 911 fees that you pay on cell phone bills, landlines, VoIP, that's those, those come to know. us and we okay. coordinate the 911 service with these uh, different entities that run the PSEPs. Thank you so much, You're I appreciate welcome. it. Learn something. I, I learned something new today. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, I believe you have some questions. Uh, well, just a comment for the board. As as a law enforcement officer, I have unfortunately been on the receiving end of emergency communications that did not have redundancy and did not have secondary points. Um, and this benefits not just our district but the entire county, um, and makes us a stronger community partner, in my opinion, with all of the um, public service agencies in the county. Um, and I can see only positive from this as a law enforcement officer. Okay. Any other thoughts? I'm just, um, you know, why, why haven't we done it until now? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, why haven't we done it until now? So, 
we discussed years ago. So one of the decision matrices is that you interact with 911 a certain amount of time. So you have uh, per day, per year, that you interact with 911 a number of times. That's data that was not tracked for several years. And it was our dispatch center was not prepared with the infrastructure to be able to handle something like that. We, you have to have um, uh, 24 hour generator services. You have to have UPS bat battery backups. You have to have recording systems for all the phones. And for years, we didn't have all of those things in place that would allow this to happen without it being an astronomically expensive thing. Um, since moving into our new police department 11 years ago, uh, in that vicinity, we have all of those things. And uh, we've had discussions on and off about doing this, um, but we're at a point now where our interaction with 911 has grown so much and it, it's now recorded on a daily basis and we think it's time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other discussion? All right, hearing none, call the vote. All those in favor, with uplifted hand. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Bagelock, appreciate it. My understanding is item 6A is uh, to be pulled from the agenda, is that correct? Yeah, Mr. Hubert, um, just with the, with the board's approval, we're gonna ask to uh, pull item 6A. We just received our star scores la late last week um, for this, this previous year, and we'd like to update the, the goals information with that newest data prior to making the presentation to you. So we'd like to pull that and bring it back to you in July when we can be a little more thorough with our information. Any, any yeah. objections to that? No. All right, very good. I'm 7A, Receive Capital Improvements Update. All right, with us tonight is Mr. Danny Phillips. I think uh, when you see the presentation and how much work's going on, uh, Mr. Foster's gonna owe Mr. Phillips a dinner or something for making this presentation, I believe, <laughs> this evening. Good evening, President Hubert. Yes, sir. Members of the board, Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to bring you guys the Capital Improvements Update for this month. We'll start with the York Junior High additions. York Junior High, uh, first photo you'll see here is the exterior building envelope completion. You'll notice that's this brand new front roof on the addition. All the exterior building envelope. We'll be working on the uh, exterior landscaping over the next couple months. Next photo is what you'll see is on the interior, the finishes that are ongoing. You'll see the millwork, the carpet, these are on the addition. Of course, there's a few other areas that we're working on. These are corridors. We're working through the corridors to get those completed and finished up. The last area is the, call, is the, uh, the uh, lab. This area is, is uh, working to get the floor in. This facility is scheduled to be completed and opened up for the August 21. Our next facility is the Woodlands College Park, the school additions there. Here's a, a Photo of the exterior area it shows the roof, the site. Here's another photo showing the exterior building envelope completed, the landscape. Here's one of our labs. This is our culinary lab. It's nearing uh, completion. Of course, it's work they're working through for the ceiling and the flooring. Here's one of our SGIs. Again, this facility is scheduled to be opened up for the August 21. We'll be looking for furniture middle of uh, July. Our next facility is the Woodlands High School addition. The Woodlands High School is a three-story specialty classes that we installed. This photo here is showing the exterior building envelope completed, exterior landscaping, things of that nature, of course, is coming. The roof is sealed up. This one here is our one of our classrooms. It's nearing completed. There's a few details on that one, but uh, this facility here will be receiving furniture in July as well for a uh, August 21 completion. Our next facility is our Armstrong. It's a campus renovations 21. Armstrong was to receive a, a classroom, uh, a lounge, and a kitchen addition. This is our exterior waiting on the, the brick veneer. We started our roof sealants. On the interior, you'll see that the we, we have the CM masonry uh, units installed. Uh, ongoing. This is the, the kitchen addition here. This facility is scheduled to open back up, of course, for the August 21 uh, school year as well. Campus re renovations on Ride Elementary. Ride Elementary is a is a complete MEP HVAC uh, update. 
What you see here is the new HVAC ductwork, things above the ceiling. So they've already demoed and they're going back in with the new. Again, Ride Elementary will open up and be completed for the August 21 school year as well. Creighton Elementary overhaul. Creighton Elementary overhaul was a complete HVAC uh, renovation, a building envelope update, a building roof completion, uh, complete install. What you'll notice here is the roof. The roof is uh, about 80% and this, this facility here will indeed uh, be completed for the August of 21 as well. The new junior high, uh, of course we know that's a new name for it, of course, uh, but uh, the Caney Creek Junior High, we'll, we'll see a, a site photo here. We'll, we'll, you'll notice the paving that is in, uh, installed. Here's another area. We're just about completed with the first floor, the basement floor, or the base floor, and then you'll notice the, the structural assembly beginning. Here's the fine arts area for the structural assembly that's ongoing. Again, this one uh, will finish up in August of 23. Conroe High School renovations. Conroe High School is a multi-phase project, as you know. This is a site a photo here for the athletics um, addition. This is the this is the athletics area starting the underground utilities, and there's a little uh, stem wall on the other side, retaining wall that's ongoing. This this facility area here, the athletics is scheduled to be completed for August of 22. The next aerial photo, what Real you'll quick. notice, yes, go ahead. The, go back to two, two pictures. The uh, This one? Yes, sir. So the, the softball and the baseball fields, they're not being touched, correct? I mean, the, the football field got a new, we're getting some things done there, but the softball and the baseball field, are they at, they're going to stay as is? Currently, yes. Okay. I believe we've got a batting cage, a softball batting cage. Okay. That uh, that's added on later on, a couple years down the road, but we're not doing anything with the. Or if you're in reference to the turf or grass, yes, et cetera, no, sir, we're not. Uh, we just finished up the turf here, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll have turf on the other practice field. Got it. Okay. We good? Yes, sir. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, that's the athletics we spoke of. This is the aerial for the, the what we call the northwest parking lot, which will be student parking, and then behind the the band hall, we'll have a CTE addition. Uh, this phase right here, we, we plan on having the, this is the, the, the subgrade for the parking lot. We'll have the, the parking lot completed and we anticipate that. Um, no bars held, uh, we'll, we'll have that for August of 21 for the parking. The CTE addition is scheduled for August 22. That work? Like I said, this is a multi-phased uh, project. It's 54 months, so there's going to be numerous updates on this in different areas, and that's what we'll be working on for Conroe High School. The new teaching center uh, at Wood Forest Stadium, you'll notice the yellow area there. That is our, our slab that has been 80% installed. You'll notice the slab is about 80%. The crane in, in the area there, we're starting the structural assembly. This facility here is scheduled to be opened up uh, spring, end of February, spring of 22. All right. Our safety and security uh, project for the district, we had nine facilities this year. Uh, this photo here is of Haley Elementary. We're going through each one of these facilities. We're doing our upgrades and our updates. Uh, each one of these facilities will have a substantial completion on these for August of 21 this year. So no holds on any of that. Our new Flex 21 uh, on the Conrail feeder, of course, we have a new name for that one as well. And, and next month, we'll put the, these on the, 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 the slides for us. The Flex 21 is the photo is the site uh, plans there. Well, you'll see that we've got paving on, on, on the ground. We've also got steel that's being delivered out there. You'll notice the crane and you'll notice parts of the slab. That is the, fi the fine arts and the gymnasium that is poured there uh, currently. Here's another photo of the crane and the getting ready for the structural assembly. This facility here is scheduled to be opened up August of 22. Oak Ridge High School overhaul in the South County CTE. We just started that one in June of this year. You'll notice that uh, there's not a whole lot going on, but what our first phases are is our new chiller plant, central plant, and then of course the new HVAC updates on the interior. 
The photo you see here is the, the starting processes of the mechanical systems installation. This is also a phased project, and there'll be multiple phases on this one. Uh, but we will have school in session in August of 21, of course. Our next project is, is the Wilkerson Intermediate. We've added the PE edition. At the, this photo here is the site planning and the site demo that we've already started on it. We've got a drainage system. We've got a building pad and things of that nature. Here's, here's the layout and the working of the building pad. We just started this one in June. Here is the actual site uh, storm system that is being installed. This facility here will be completed for the January af uh, return after winter break. And our final project here is Conroe High School ninth grade. Uh, we have a classroom addition. What you see here is where the, the 10 classroom addition occurs, where the dirt area is in the middle of the spine there. Um, they just started on this one, so We've started our demo, and on the back side at the, the fire lane, uh, you'll see the bus loop. We're extending the bus loop, and we'll have this bus loop completed by the August start of school. The addition will be completed by August of 22. And that sums up our update. And I drove by Hope Elementary at, uh, Tuesday, I believe, or yes, Monday sir. of this week. It looks like they're all in. They were Parking lot was full. Yes, sir. There's a lot of activity going on. We're moving for uh, Rick Rees and his team is bringing his furniture in in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a principal in there, so we're right. eager for that one. Great. Thank you so much. We'll schedule a time in the next few weeks to make it available for you all to walk if you'd like. As well. We need to do that first, Stockton, as well. <laughs> yes, all right. All right. Uh, item 8, a consider award of RFP 21-04-05, con concierge services. Dr. Noel. No. All right. Mr. Mr. Rick huh? Reeves. Concession. Concierge. concierge. Yeah, we're, we're becoming a fully custom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I give you all, you all, the, all the hard ones to say, right? <laughs> Where's Nicole May? I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Tonight we're requesting that the board considers awarding RFP number 21-04-05 concessionaire services to Spectrum Catering and Concessions for an estimated annual commission of $150,000. Requests for proposals pertaining to concessionaire services were emailed to registered vendors through the electronic e-bidding system, advertised on the CISD purchasing website, and also multiple times in the courier. In this RFP, vendors were asked to offer a percentage of gross sales to be paid to Conroe ISD for the right to operate at Moorhead Stadium, Wood Forest Bank Stadium, and the Natatorium concessions on an exclusive basis. Uh, we had two vendors submit a response. This, this contract with the awarded vendor will remain firm through June of 2022, automatically renewing for four additional one-year terms through June of 2026. These proposals were evaluated by the CISD Athletic Department and reviewed by the CISD Purchasing Department. Recommendations for award are notated on the attached list, and at this time, we recommend your approval. I move we approve as presented. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Um, does this new contract in any way interfere with the booster clubs, the Boy Scouts, anybody to do their fundraisers in the concessionary? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Thank you. Okay, that was my question, but more so what date, I mean, is it what are they exclusive to, high school events or what events? Any of the events that Any we run at the stadium. Like junior high events? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Am I not mistaken or do I see those booster club folks in those concessions at some yes. of those events? Yes. So, they, so, so it's any, not at those events? There, it's anything that's done at our, the Moorhead, Wood Forest, and the Natatorium. So any of the high school events, um, the band, fine arts, those types of events. Okay, so I'm still, I'm still confused as to Mr. Moore's question. How does that... There's no there's no interference between month. those between those so. So they're you not competing. You see yes. Parents working they're working Correct. through the concession there. Right. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Selling coke to their activities. Okay. Got Correct. it. Now it makes sense because we were crossing. Sorry. The <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. I got it. Makes sense. And so that that's outside in above and beyond this 150. This fix is going to the district. Or is it not? Yeah, they're paying, they're paying to, to work. Directly. Yes. Correct. I don't get it. So he takes in money. This is, I'm going to make sure I don't stand on it. Because I understand it. He takes yep. in money. He, he keeps some for himself. He pays some to his workers who may be our volunteers, and he pays us a portion. 
Correct. What portion do we get? We get 35%. What dollar amount? What's the 100? How did you come up with that? This, this is what we've looked at our past, the past, because this is the incumbent that actually is being awarded again, so we have that data. Okay, so my question is, I think you've answered it. The estimate portion, as you outlined, outlined in your example, that 35% or whatever that percentage is, should equate to about $150,000. Correct. Got it. I'm Correct. On, I'm on board mm -hmm. now. Good stuff. Is that good? Anybody else? All right. All those in favor? Left of the hand. Any opposed? Same sign. All right. Very good. Motion passes. Item B, consider award of RFP 21-01-04 on-site clinic management services. Once again, we're recommending that the board considers awarding RFP number 21-01-04 on-site clinic management services to Memorial Herman for an estimated annual expenditure of $700,000. The request for proposals pertaining to the procurement of on-site clinic management and operations services for the district's existing on-site medical clinic were emailed to register vendors through the electronic e-bidding system advertised on the CIC purchasing website and also two times in the courier. In this RFP, vendors were asked to provide annual management fees and standard medical service fees for managing and operating the district's on-site clinic. We had five responses. Proposals were evaluated by members of the district's Financial Services Department, Human Resources Department, and a subcommittee of the Employee Benefits Committee with consultation from the district's insurance consultant, Gallagher Risk Management Services. During this process, the committee began to explore other options, but ultimately believed it was in the best interest of the district to continue to support the clinic at this time due to employees electing to use it as part of their chosen benefit plan. This will also allow the district more time to evaluate future options as well as continue to monitor, monitor the performance of the clinic post-COVID. Upon award, the contract will be effective for two years through August 31st, 2023, with an option to renew annually for three additional one-year terms through August 2026. Funds for these services are provided in the self-funded health insurance fund, and at this time, we recommend your approval. Okay. I move that, um, I make a motion that we approve the RFP for the on-site clinic management, clinic management services. Okay. Second. We have a second. All right. Any discussion or questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Ms. Chen. No, go ahead. Okay. So in looking at the scoring rubric, um, there's less than one point spread between the first and second place there, but there's quite a few points difference in the price. Do you have, I, I didn't see the breakdown of each individual part of the rubric. Can you give me the difference in price between uh, it was Memorial and was approximately um, about $70,000. Over the course of the three year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. My, my question, uh, I need some, my memory's fading, but I remember Gallagher being here mm -hmm. and we were talking about benefits and we were talking about, Tim, okay, <laughs> Mr. Rice is an <laughs> I, 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 and Mr. Rice, I don't remember all of the conversation, <laughs> but I thought that we had talked about that we were going to try to find a less expensive option for yes. our employees to be able to go to because we felt like the on-site clinic was costing too much. Yes, and sir. the Gallagher was looking into that. Yes, sir, as if you, if you may recall, during the COVID epidemic, yes. participation in our clinics went, went from down. what we would consider yep. break even to, you yep. know, and we, we consider that about 550 to 600 visits per month. We were averaging about 330 visits per month, so well below what we consider break even. Right. So at that time we were, uh, when the administrative piece of the clinic came up, we, we started thinking, well, with the clinic not breaking even, should we look at alternative ways to spend that almost $700,000 a year that could provide benefits to our employees, yeah, right. you know, it, Correct. more efficiently? Um, the, one of the problems with that is, is that employees made their benefit choices knowing that the clinic would be there for them to use. Whether okay. they took a high deductible plan and knew that they would only have a $10 copay when they went to our clinic. There was some 987 employees that, that did choose the clinic as their, pri as their primary care. Okay. So taking that into consideration. Um, and then also looking at post-COVID, once, you know, as we move out of COVID, will the clinic regain its steam and get above break even? Right. If that happens, the clinic is a, a you know a feasible alternative for our employees. So we wanted to give ourselves time to look at that, give the clinic time to rebound. If it does, okay. then we've made the correct choice. If not, it does give us time 
to next year's benefit cycle to be able to let employees know ahead of time that the clinic will not be available to them and give them the appropriate information to make their decisions uh, with their benefit package. Okay, that's fair. I mean, I, I just remember having that conversation. No, no, yes. we, we, so we're I, I was the one that brought you the history that we did it because we were trying to save some money and trying to save yeah. employees and, and, and copay because and 10 buck copay is a whole lot better than 35 or 50 or whatever else. And, and, and one of the things in that, if you remember, we were saying we would uh, uh, waive the deductible for the um, Correct. Telemedicine. That's right. We're going to go ahead and do that anyway. It, it was only a thirty-six thousand dollar cost okay. per year to the plan, but we think the benefits outweigh that cost. Yes. Because it will save us on emergency room, and if you just save one or two emergency room visits, yeah. you yeah. will recoup we made that our money back. Right. Yes. Very, very yes. easily. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for helping me. And Mr. Sanders, thanks for asking because we were down here scratching our heads on that one too. Yeah. All right. Any other conversation or questions? All right. Hearing none. Um, I call the vote. All those in favor? My left uplifted hand. Any opposed on the same side? All right. Motion passes. Moving on to item C, receive update regarding the ESSER Act. All right, Dr. Hines, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Knoll. Uh, tonight, I wanted to uh, just kind of, it's probably been uh, about six weeks since we gave you an overview. Wanted to come back and kind of um, update you on where we are with planning for the ESSER funds or the elementary and secondary school emergency relief. I'm also going to include in this title the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services planning because that is also a part of the ESSER application. So we have two plans um, and so I just want to clarify that up front. There's two plans. The district plan um, for how we're going to spend ESSER funds and, and I'm going to give you an overview, provide you a, a brief overview of where we are with that. Uh, and then the other one is our safe return, the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan, which we on our website refer to as the roadmap to reopening um, or re to remaining open. And uh, we have a re uh, reopening task force that we convened last year that worked on that project, which, um, and so we've kind of reconvened that group to, to revise and relook at that plan uh, to, to anticipate and get ready for the coming school year. Uh, and we'll just take you to a brief look at our web pages we have um, on our website and it'd probably be helpful for you to see where we put the information. Uh, so when you go on the, the home page, there is certainly the roadmap to remaining open and then down below under the leading news, you can see there's our, um, where we're asking for input on the use of the ESSER funds. And so if we go to the uh, roadmap to remaining open. We have we met last week, our group met last week, and we've already made some revisions, and obviously this is kind of a work in progress throughout the summer uh, if we need to come back and look at it, but you can see we have a little Q&A, and um, it's a much shorter guidance, and um, so there's some information there, and there's really um, not much. We just received the guidance from the, and we can go show the ESSER page. There's an ESSER page that you can get to off of that page as well. And it kind of shows the priorities. Uh, there's a place if you click on that orange bar there for the feedback, it takes you to a survey. And so far, we've had about 500 uh, results. I'll share a little bit of where we are with the survey results. And then there's some information about ESSER and the money, and there's some uh, an FAQ portion down at the bottom. So um, since the last time we were here, we got that up and running to try to um, get that information out there. Um, I'm going to just mention briefly and we'll, um, you know, that we did meet last week. We did uh, review it and we do have the updated information. This is really the extent of the information that we received from the state. So we had a lot of guidance last year. In June 5th, the state came out with new guidance for the coming year and it's basically really just three things. One, um, you can't require anybody to wear a mask, staff or students. Two, uh, you have to report all the cases to your local health department if you have any known cases. And then three, you have to report them on the website to the Texas Department of Health. So, you know, those three things are still there. Uh, we still plan to maintain our, um, for the time being, and we will, we will maintain our uh, dashboard so we can track cases, but it will only track the cases we know about. And so uh, uh, there's been a lot of changes, and we're trying to get out of the contact tracing business and, and all of that. So we had a lot of energy wrapped up in that. So we'll have more information to share later as we finalize that. And we've got a couple of months to get it ready. But we wanted to get something in place for summer school so we can 
uh, we can be in motion and kind of get a feel for what's working and what's not working. Uh, just to remind you what ESSER is, that is the, um, there were three different ESSER funds that were approved. ESSER 3 is the one that was done in March, um, and it's money that's intended to respond to pandemic and address student learning loss as a result of COVID. We received uh, the original allocation, the initial allocation is for two thirds of the total amount, which is 43137000 The total allocation is almost $65 million. Uh, we just learned very, very recently that we are going to receive ESSER two funds and our allocation will be $28,811,173. Now that is uh, also what is going to pay for this past year's hold harmless. So this last school year, um, as you're well aware, we had a hold harmless, which, which basically allowed us to operate with the given, knowing that we were down in enrollment, knowing that attendance was going to be off, that we knew we would have a certain amount of money coming in. And so once, once they deduct that and we'll have to finalize all the attendance and send it to the state, and once all that gets finalized, they'll come up with, they'll settle up and whatever's left will come back to us and will be incorporated into our plan. Uh, and so we'll go back to the task force and we'll keep, keep looking at it. Now the biggest difference with ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 is they added a year for ESSER 3. So we have till t September of 2024. This money will end in September of 23. So this is true two year money. So we'll have to keep that in mind. So ESSER does have uh, two planning requirements. One is 20% must be spent on learning loss and that's not gonna be a problem for us. I imagine more than the majority will go for that. And then there's a maintenance of equity provision. And that's simply um, what that, the best example I can think of is in special education. We can supplant costs, but as a district, we can't spend less than we spent last year in special education by using this money. So we have to continue our commitment to these certain programs. So, um, and that's not gonna be a problem for us. So to work on planning for this, ESSER, we convened a task force. We also, uh, we, we, we included our district level and planning committee. So we've had district staff, campus staff, parents and community members as part of this process. We've so far had five meetings. We've, and this group has really helped kind of shape this because it was really kind of, and we felt a lot of urgency, especially with hiring. And I'm just gonna say that up front, that this is gonna be a very busy hiring season, not just for us, but for every district is going through the same exercise, right? They have a lot of money and they're trying to decide how to spend it. Uh, so this group worked through, we established categories, we established planning amounts, priorities, and guidance for campuses, and we developed and put a survey online. Uh, so we've had some responses. We had several teachers and parents and counselors and community members give some feedback, and that's just who's participated so far. That was as of yesterday, so we might have had some more. Um, we've had some interesting uh, feedback in terms of, you know, interventions that are preferred after school tutorials, summer school, targeted small groups, <coughs> summer enrichment were all popular. Um, adding technology, mobile connectivity, academic interventionist, behavioral support, online learning, and additional materials and software were also identified for recovering learning. There was very strong support to use the funds, use some of the funds to respond to social and emotional needs of our students with additional counselors, behavior support, communities and schools programs, and additional teachers. There was very strong support to set aside some funds for um, attendance and enrollment fluctuations and hold harmless. There was strong support that if we can uh, manage the funds and maybe get more than three years of money out of this. And there's a way to do that by, if we take some money and, and supplant from our budget and take some of that money and set it aside perhaps as a kind of an ESSER transition fund to give us some money so we'll have in year four, we can have some money. Um, there was also strong support for campuses to be included in the planning. And then there was support for our virtual school. And I'm gonna say this about the virtual school, it did not make it out of the legislative session. So that is on hold. Uh, so we are um, gonna be notifying our uh, families that had signed up that we're interested in it tomorrow, that that's not going to be in play for this coming school year for us. Um, we don't know that it, it, it could come up in a special session, so it may return in the 22-23 school year, and so uh, you'll see in our budget priorities that we left a placeholder for that in case it does come back. We, we've talked about our priorities before in the past. We also tried to include in the plan those priorities. We wanna be transparent, wanna meet the needs of our students most impacted by the pandemic, 
We want to use evidence-based interventions. We want to prioritize equity. We want to have a, a engagement, and we want to have strong fiscal safeguards. Probably the biggest challenge for this process has been it came right at the end of the school year. Uh, so it's been really hard to get people pulled in because people have been very busy. I won't go through all the things it can be used for, but the uses are very broad, and pretty much anything <coughs> under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, many programs, and, and, and you'll see we also not only want to recover lost learning, we don't want to look up and see gaps reemerging with our kids. So, um, you know, in other words, we don't want to find out that three or four years from now that our most at-risk students are not taking upper-level courses because they got behind during the pandemic. So things like we want to be kind of forward-thinking. We want to think not just about lost learning, but also students that are not performing to their full potential, and that includes our upper-level courses as well. Uh, we can also include workforce readiness, um, internet accessibility, uh, and any things that would better prepare our students for entering college. Again, I won't go through all the activities, but there's many things that we're thinking about, and these can include mental health supports, purchasing technology, um, anything that is used to keep us operating. We will have to submit our application uh, for our grant award. Uh, it's due by late July. Uh, we hopefully will be ready by early July is our kind of our timeline as we're marching through this. Um, we're, we're getting further along. We are still in a kind of a draft form, but this is where we are at this point. We are using the total of 64 million for our total plan for the three years. Um, we are using 43 for those first two years um, that, so we're, we have to plan for that amount and then work in the third amount. And you can see these are the categories that have kind of come out uh, and I'll just briefly kind of take you through what each of these categories are. Um, the campus formula staff, this has really been very helpful. We've been able to fund several positions. In addition to using, uh, we have reserve units and what's in our budget. Um, as you know, we're, we're unknown enrollment and probably the hardest thing for us going into next school year is are we gonna see a bubble in certain grades? Are we gonna see kind of a, 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 a rebound with, with some extra enrollment? So we've been able to fund a lot of positions that schools are on the bubble for qualifying for uh, with this money so that if the enrollment shows up, we'll have those positions already in place. Um, and it's been very helpful for us to do it because we know this is going to be a very competitive hiring season out there. So we wanted to get on these. Um, we've also included some district support positions. Most of these are geared towards serving special programs or special populations. Uh, also includes some administrative support in some of the areas that were most impacted by COVID, including HR, teaching and learning, um, special education, communications. You can see there's a print graph, graphic designer on here. We have adding some social workers, uh, special education bilingual teachers, some GT teachers to work on underrepresented groups, dyslexia teachers to serve our dyslexic students, uh, additions of six communities and school programs to the 16 we already have. And those would be at Rice Reeves, Hope, Milan, Glenlock, and Armstrong. Uh, some help in human resources again. And then, as you know, we are still on track. We won't fill this till we get, till we know if we're in the teacher incentive allotment, but getting ready for that, uh, the teacher incentive allotment. Dr. Hines, can you go back? Sure. I just have a question about those community and school additions. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a full time. Position. It's a full-time position. Community schools is a grant program, so we pay half, and then community schools through the state grant pays right. the other half. And do they? Does that include benefits? No, sir. I mean, it, they're it's contracted by us, so they're not a full-time district employee. They're a contracted employee. Okay. And so, okay, because my understanding is that people in those positions, because there's no benefits that come with them, as soon as another position in the school opens up a lot of them do we end up having a lot of transition into and out of that job category because of that and some we've had that some that have been there several years some consistency when you're talking about people that are in our community and connecting mm -hmm. with our parents and our kids you know if it was Susie last month then it's Nancy and then it's Joe and you know, it, it just it 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 seems like that could be very frustrating to those parents that are trying to engage with that community and schools person. It could, and um, you know, I think as a, overall as a commentary, I'd say a lot of our positions have become more like that where people tend to be yep. a year on at a time. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, but I would say for communities and schools, you know, I'm aware of some folks that have turned over, but I, I know I can think of a few people who have been there six or seven years that they're building. Mm -hmm. And so we have some that do stay. Okay. And a lot of it depends on their circumstances. It's not the highest paying job. A lot right. of folks are overqualified. And so some of them, they get better opportunities and they move on. Right. Um, some really love their work and what they do and they tend to stay. So we see I some sure of both. I sure wish we could find a way for those kinds of people that are having direct contact with our parents and with our students to offer them you know a position that helps them i mean we had a comment tonight public comment about you know benefits and the cost of benefits and i know the cost of benefits is expensive but to be able to offer whether they accept it or not is on their on their own i'm just i'm just thinking out loud it seems like there so is we a, don't have turnover. There is a similar position, and it's on, it's on this page, and I want to show this to you, Mr. Okay. Sanders. Uh, sure. On this page, this is a campus learning. So right now in our plan, uh, roughly $16.5 is is reserved to be distributed to campuses for use. And we've identified positions that we think would meet their needs and be good uses of this. And, and one of them is a family, a parent involvement liaison aid, and that's a... Um, a, a non-professional but in terms of pay it's very similar duties and we often have found people very similar qualifications but it does come with full-time employment okay. and benefits so we do offer a district kind of a version of that the difference is it's not affiliated with the larger network of communities and schools which is a statewide network right. so right. they would be our person now we'll okay. say mr chavez and i've been in discussions and um, we're already working up training for these positions because we envision that some of the schools are going to be picking these positions with their funds. But they also have, a, they also have an option. They could pick and add a communities and schools if they don't have it as well. Right. Right. And so they see a full kind of a the way, the way we've set it up. And I, I can't say enough about the finance department's done a great job. Dr. Upshaw and her team have, have worked on this. Um, all of our assistant superintendents have been involved. Um, and they've done some great work when we've really tried to simplify it for our principals. But they've really created just a drop down menu of here's some positions. And, uh, and, and they will have a budget, and the budget is calculated depending on two things. One, by the size of their campus, and the other one will give a weight for the number of economically disadvantaged students. Absolutely. So we do weight it, and, and, and it's going to vary. Like, I'll give you an example, Ford Elementary, for example, for their two-year planning amount, they have a budget of 269000 and some odd. Um, you know, Bosman Intermediate, it's almost 250000 uh, York Junior High is 323000 uh, Conroe High School is f almost 580,000, just to give you an idea. Of their but there's amounts. a bigger population at those schools yes. right, as well. So right? as the bigger the school, they're going to get bigger Absolutely. money. Absolutely, that makes more sense. We also worked it, you know, or set it up so that each school has a minimum amount, so they could hire at least one person each year if they wanted to do that. So everybody had like a floor put in. And then there was a group of people that went back and forth. There's nothing scientific about it. It's just really through discussions and playing with and modeling it that we came to this plan. Um, but we think it's a good way of distributing funds, and, and right now it's a big part of our plan is to send it out. So to answer your question and, okay. and, and mention this at the same time, that that is an option. There is a local option similar to what communities and schools does, either as a paraprofessional or as a professional position. We offer both. Okay. Now, the job descriptions are different, sure. and, but we do offer both, and there is, uh, there is one. That's, the other one is called the Family Engagement Liaison. Okay. And you can see counselors are also available, behavior interventionists, academic interventionists have been very popular, additional teacher training, technology. So they have a wide, um, a wide list of things to look at. Hey, real quick for yes. you. Um, in the model where you decided the allocation to the campuses, did you also consider the percentage of in-person versus remote the campuses had? No. 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 Because no, everyone will be in person next year. It'll be 100% next year. Yeah, yeah. But just to, uh, if, if a campus had more uh, remote learners than another, then theoretically they may need more funds to do intervention. And, and they could, and I think that's something we'll look back. I mean, we, do, we there are, and I'm gonna get to the end, there's a certain amount of money we haven't allocated yet, and so uh, we're, we're anticipating two things. One is either targeted assistance based on some other things that come to play as we get data, and, and part of this plan and I really think it's important is it's not going to be written in stone. We're going to start it off and we're going to evaluate as we go. And if it's not efficient, we're going to make some changes. And if we see some areas that need 
uh, more attention, we're going to develop and direct more resources that way. If I can just circle back, Mr. Sanders, we'll ask the question of community and schools because it is a grant and that those they are technically employees of community and schools right. work in our building. I don't know that we have the option to, to do anything, but we, we can ask the question. If, if we can do anything on top of what they already do or if that's a locked in we'll right. just we'll research it but we do have some um, it does pay below our teacher pay grade it's so like we I know the example of um, a young man that was a community and schools representative when I worked at Conroe High School went back and got his teaching credentials now he teaches at Stockton Junior High he was the teacher of the year at Washington last year before they moved so Mm -hmm. We find these great people, and it's, sure. we try to keep them. Even if they move out of that role, right. it might be another role for them. Right. No, I us. think they want to stay with yes. the district. Right. Mm -hmm. We do. We have some really outstanding folks that get into those roles. So that's that's one of the areas. Probably our biggest um, footprint is on campus funds. Hold harmless is the other one we have a placeholder for. So again, right now we have twelve million five hundred thousand set aside to protect us for attendance and uh, not meeting enrollment projections. Possibilities may not happen, but we want to be prepared. And again, those are funds that can be, if if they aren't needed, then we could either reallocate in some way or set aside for transitioning. Um, this is summer school. We're also funding summer school over four summers. This summer is a really good example of all the, um, for your secondary uh, remediation courses, were, no, there was no tuition this year. Uh, so all the high schools and junior high students benefited from that. There's normally no tuition for any of those programs for elementary and intermediate. Um, but we're up to 5,505 students, which is about a 40% increase over where we were two years ago. Um, we probably could have done more, but we can only get we can only get so many teachers this summer. This was a rough year for hiring for the summer. It was a rough year. Surprised they didn't want to all sign yeah. up for more of this. Yeah. 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 Give me more. Yeah. And but we'll be we'll, we were planning for a very big summer school next year, and we, we think it'll be much bigger. Uh, and, and then the other category is software, Wi-Fi, staff development, technology. It kind of all falls in the non-people category. So right now that's at about $7,600,000. It includes a lot of the district-wide software that we acquire or want to acquire. Uh, it pr uh, includes a lot of professional development, uh, mobile connectivity, enhanced Wi-Fi, transportation software, computers, iPads, laptops, Chromebooks. Um, with virtual Academy I mentioned we are not planning now we're moving off of the 21 22 year and now we're starting to look at the possibility for a 22 23 year so we're gonna have a number set aside for that year and then there's a total of twelve million three hundred thirty six thousand six hundred one dollars that have yet to be allocated or, or planned for and so I think there's there's still some more work to do in addition to the, whatever the remainder is of that $28 million that will come into play. And I think that's kind of, we're kind of waiting to see the whole total to come in. Um, our first, our first order of business is to get this application in and get approved and really start, start the process. So these are kind of our next steps. We want to get this application in, stay current, be mindful. These are one time funds. And right now we know there's a lot of potential positions, uh, hitting the district, all of which we have the potential in any given year of really absorbing. Um, that's the good news with the exception of some of those specialized things. Um, but also, we also know that we're going to grow, hopefully keep growing each year for the next couple of years, and that can also help mitigate the cliff a little bit. And then if we can put some money aside, uh, we can also help um, develop some options for transitioning. So we're still working through it, and that's where we are today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to all right. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Thank you. Appreciate it. A lot of work. Thank you, Dr. Hines yeah. and the team. Dr. Hines, one question. Does that application require board approval? I mean, we've kind of gone through it. It, it will not a formal it, board it, approval. It, it won't. It'll require Dr. Knowles' approval. Okay. All right. But, um, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Okay. We'll, we'll, All right. In a few weeks, we'll be ready. Right. Very good. Item 8D, receive preliminary to... 2021-2022 budget overview. All right, Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice. All right, good evening, President Huber, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to present the 2021-2022 preliminary budget. 
And there, there was a reason that we had Dr. Hines go right before this because that program, as you can see, is actually going to be supporting, uh, in, in a sense, our 2021-22 our our budget. So uh, with that, we will start uh, with the results of the 87th legislative session. Um, good thing is that House Bill 3 was fully funded by the state. However, they did have a cleanup bill, which was House Bill 1525. And that bill uh, did some changes to the CTE, SCE, our fast growth allotment, GT and CCMR calculations. Our one concern, if you remember at the past board workshop, was the fast growth allotment. Um, in the first calculations, we were concerned with uh, a loss of about $7 million. So fast forward that to the end of the legislative session and the final re revision to that, we actually ended up with a gain of about $2 million in that program. So, so just through the legislative session, uh, it turned positive for us. Uh, Dr. Hines talked about the virtual academy and that did not make uh, the final vote. Um, we're still holding out hope that it does uh, get into the special session in the future. House Bill 3445, the fund balance bill, if y'all remember, that was the bill that would limit cash on hand to 110 days. That bill did not make it out of the House, so that does not have any effect to us. And then some of the un unknowns that are out there, one of the unknowns is COVID-19. We do not know what the state of COVID-19 is gonna be when our students uh, report back to school in the fall. Um, the other one is the challenge with the enrollment projections. And uh, as Dr. Hines says, we do have protections built in the ESSER fundings um, you know, for that, and I have this chart to show you that it's really been kind of a roller coaster ride with our enrollment. So let's start in 1920. We ended that school year 64,799 students. Now, y'all know the previous 10 years at least, we had 1,500, you could count on it, 1,500 students every year. So for 2021, we counted on those 1,500 students. We budgeted 66,298. When we opened the doors in September of 2021, 64,565 students showed up. Um, however, we did rebound. We added 795 students throughout the year and we ended the year 65,360 students. So for 21-22, we're gonna use 66,298 students. So once again, just to, to go over the ESSER funding that the school district has received or is subject to receive. ESSER 1, if y'all remember, that was the first CARES Act that came out the state uh, the federal government identified $6.5 million that would come to the district. However, the state did supplant the state budget with that, and they just dropped our ADA to account for that, so we, we receive uh, no new money. ESSER 2 funding, right now it's looking at $28.8 million. However, they are gonna use uh, some of those funds to supplant the state budget again to pay for the hold harmless that, that we had last year. Um, ESSER 3 money, uh, ESSER 3 funding, um, the state cannot supplant the state budget. So we will receive uh, $64.7 million of ESSER three money. So now taking a look at the major components that drive the budget, and they begin with our 2021-2022 budget objectives, and they include to meet the needs for the 21-22 school year. This year we'll, we will be opening Hope Elementary and the Teacher Training Center. We want to provide a competitive compensation plan and we want to continue to meet the needs as outlined by House Bill 3. That includes the, the reading academies and the teacher incentive allotment. Y'all heard a lot about this this past year. And then we want to provide continued support for maintaining a safe environment for our students and staff. We always like to compare ourselves uh, with our tax rate with the greater Houston area. You can see Conroe ISD there in the red. Uh, we are the third lowest tax rate in the greater Houston area at $1.2125. Uh, the school districts in the dark blue, that is our local Montgomery County school districts. And in the green, those are our peer school districts that we not only compare to financially, but also academically. And you can see we compare very well to all of those categories. Our fund balance analysis, our current unassigned fund balance is $153.7 million, and that's about 27% of our budget. And as you know, our goal is to maintain an unassigned fund balance in the range of 20 to 25% of our budget. Our current budget, budget is uh, $576.9 million. So at 25%, the high end of our goal, our fund balance would need to be $144.2 million. So we're about $9.4 million over that. So at the board's discretion, it would be there for their use. Do you have questions? No. Okay, I'm sorry. And uh, on the low end target, 
Our target would be $115.4 million, so there's available of $38.3 million to use at the board's discretion. So our fund balance is in good shape, and we are anticipating our fund balance to increase at the end of this year uh, in excess of $7.5 million. So this is probably the single most important slide we'll look at this evening, and that is based uh, because of our, our state revenue estimates and campus expenditure budget allocations rely on our enrollment data. For the upcoming 2021-2022 uh, budget, we're using an enrollment of 66,298 and an ADA percentage of 94.2%. And the importance of that 94.2% for ADA, I would just like to point out for every percentage point that we, we, are, we are below that, if we came in at 93.2%, that would cost the district $2.5 million. So, so that, is a, that is one of those calculations that, that, important, to that would, right. Im, important to get it right and then important with the COVID situation to have that safeguard of the ESSER es, money sitting there for us. And I think it's also important to note that the expenditure budget is based on enrollment. However, we're funded based on our average daily attendance. So I think that is very important. Uh, just real quick. Mm -hmm. um, we ended the school year with about 15% still remote. Is mm -hmm. that right? Correct. Is there any indication on what the plans are of, of those families? Like, no. Uh, no, no, we know how many had we had enroll Dr. Hines in our virtual academy or express interest in the virtual academy? We had about 250, 250 that we heard from. Uh, when we did a survey, I mean, there were several people that weren't sure what they were going to do yet, mm -hmm. they didn't do it, they didn't know what they were going to do yet. So we didn't get a lot of clear, when we did the survey. I think it's one of our, it's one of what we know is a risk mm -hmm. that, that, that we can't quantify yet. So that, that's why we have that hold back money. And 1% equals approximately 2.5 million? 1% of attendance. In our, in our average daily yes. attendance Change. is $2.5 million. Yes, Thank please. you. You're so certified property values, we're using an estimated 5% growth in our assessed value. This growth will add about $2 billion to our property values, bringing our total value to $42.1 billion. And we'll be working with the appraisal district over the, uh, over the remaining months to refine our estimated values. Oh, yeah. uh, certified values do not come in from the appraisal district until uh, July 25th. But however, we would like to point out that due to House Bill 3 and the state funding uh, Robin Hood, uh, this value increase does not provide any net new revenue to our general fund. However, this is the only funding mechanism that we have in our debt service fund. So I think that's very important. However, Property values are trending a little higher than our 5% estimate. Um, so we've kind of given you an estimate here. If uh, they come in at a 5% growth, our, our, our tax rate would actually decrease by a little over two cents. If they come in at a 6% growth, almost three cents. And if it comes in at 7%, it um, would be almost four cent tax decrease. So um, looking total tax rate, this is our tax rate history. You can see how that tax rate has decreased with the implementation of House Bill 3. So we're estimating our tax rate of a, at $1.19.1 with a 5% property value growth. Hmm. So now that we have discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will look at the effect that they've had on the budget itself, starting with the 2021-2022 funding estimate. Our local revenue, which is limited to 2.5% AV growth, uh, will generate that as tax value increase, $10.1 million. However, based on Robin Hood and House Bill 3, we, they take that right off the top, so $10.1 million goes away. Our state funding increase, based on the fast growth allotment and special program changes, $2.64 million. Interest rates are still down, so we're decreasing that by $1.6 million. Our TRS in-kind fund, this is our our, in, our accounting entry that we're required to do each year, so we're increasing that by $2.5 million for total estimated funding increase of $3.54 million. Now looking at the expenditure side of the budget, this is our approved 2021-2022 general pay increase. Uh, all employees will receive a 3% raise. Uh, bus drivers, however, will receive a 5% raise, and our starting bus driver pay will be raised to $18 per hour. And then also we, re we raised all hourly employees to a minimum of $12 per hour rate. So 
very proud of both of those. I would be too. And that raises at a cost of $12.5 million. So this is our approved teacher hiring schedule. Once again, it includes a 3% general pay increase, which is e equivalent to $1,800, and a starting teacher salary of $58,500. Our personnel additions uh, for support at the campus level for our new students in the opening of Hope Elementary. It includes 32.5 new positions consisting of 19 and a half teachers, three administrators, six professionals, and four paraprofessionals at a cost of a little over $2 million. And then to support our campuses, we're adding 39.5 new positions, and this is mainly in our transportation and custodial departments at a cost of $1.4 million. In total, it is 72 new positions, totaling uh, $3.47 million. So this is our projected expenditure budget increase for 2021-22, general pay increase 12.5 million, additional personnel for HOPE and other programs 3.47 million. We do have in here a retention stipend of $10 million. We have a slide to uh, talk about that in just a moment. Other expenses that include utilities, insurance, and supplies, about 500,000. Uh, capital maintenance fund <coughs> budget decrease because we did fund that in the current year fund balance transfer that the board approved of $10 million. Our accounting entry TRS in-kind fund offset, $2.5 million for total expenditure increase of $19 million. So let's just spend a minute here and just talk about the retention stipend. With all this ESSER money that is coming up, y'all are gonna hear a lot of districts doing retention stipends. I think we've already seen Spring come out with a large uh, retention stipend. Um, but retention stipends are great tools to help manage your long-term budget. It provides compensation to retain employees, boost job, boost job satisfaction and productivity, and it's budget friendly. It's one-time money and not a perpetual expenditure and can be adjusted based on available funding. This year, we're recommending two separate retention stipends totaling $10 million. Uh, we're recommending one be issued on October 1st, and that will help retain the employees and, and add incentives for those employees to return to work at the beginning of school. And Dr. Noel, do you have a Yeah, we, we think that, you know, that's a new thought for us. It's a new way of thinking, but we do see that as a, uh, a really strong option, uh, not only with recruitment, right, as, as we're working to try to hire people to know that there would be this retention stipend early uh, in the year, but also with, with retaining some of our folks. We know, uh, as we've seen with all these ESSER positions that are out there, other districts are also getting that money and they're gonna come and try to hire some of our people. And this is just one more early incentive for people to know that if they walk away, they're also leaving you know, that there. So I, I think it's gonna work both on the recruitment and the retention side um, to, to do that in October. And then we will still have the flexibility in February, um, you know, based on enrollment and ADA percentage, you know, then we can make a determination at that point how much is available uh, in February as well. So does that still look like about $500 an employee? Yes, sir. Yes. So we think we could do 500 in October. I think that's the what we were looking to do, and we think that that would leave us potentially, once again, it's, that would make February flexible. We'd have to wait and see, but possibly another 500 in February uh, as well. Dr. No, Ms. Price, same format as before? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So flat rate, all employees, $500. So it benefits, you know, it's a, it's a really good benefit for our, at our hourly employees as well. And I think when you think about hiring bus drivers, which is something that we need to do, this could be really big. Uh, we did poll our principals and directors and everyone was very excited about the, the prospect of doing a October. October 1st, February 1st, are you talking about it'd be on the, the October 1st pay period? Yes. Yes, sir. So they would have had to have been employed by the, yeah, we'll, have by to set August, it. yeah we'll need to work out the, correct yeah. we'll need to work out the um the rules associated with it yeah, we'll have a, a date in which they must have started by and to be eligible for that just as we have for we, the we will try to include program. as many as we possibly can mm -hmm. to yeah. get them in there it's, i'm going to say this and i know it's not going to go over well do we run the risk i'm all for the stipend by the way the retention stipend do we run the risk of this being a perpetual expectation from them? Yes, sir. Yeah. If you do it once, not expected. You do it more than once, yeah. it becomes an ex expectation. But but I think I think what we're going to see moving forward is number one because it is budget friendly. Mm -hmm. That you know if you ever do run into financial situation, it is something that that we can take out of the budget. 
and it and, and it's not part of the salary that has to be there if that makes sense and there's a balance there because mm -hmm. there it is budget friendly for us because we uh, it's not guaranteed next year but the and it's nice for the employees when they receive this what feels like a bonus pay right that's nice but there is a negative for our employees in that this does not count mm -hmm. For, sure. for TRS money, so it does not count towards your retirement. So while you'll see some districts maybe do a 1% raise and then give a bigger retention stipend, mm -hmm. and that'll, that'll get in the newspaper and people might read that and say, oh, why didn't we get a bigger retention stipend? We put more in the raise because that counts for TRS money. So you, you do have to find the proper balance there. Uh, I think you know, it'll be splashy to see a lot of people doing big retention stipends, but when they're not doing a raise, in the long run, especially for folks that are in their last three years or five years, they will not view that positively because uh, it, it hurts them perpetually uh, in TRS. So it, October 1st would be a $500? Yes, sir. And then February 15th would be an additional 500? Potentially. We'll, we'll need to watch the budget, but yes, potentially. And what's the significance of February 15th? That's when we've done it the last two yeah, years. The last that's just a typical date that we've done in the past. Yeah, it's just because that's, it gives us time to verify everyone has come back in the second semester and then gives payroll time to process it and then get it on a check. It, because of the way we pay during the holidays, like the January 15th check is already done before we ever return back. And so it just gives them time to make sure it's right. So this is our 2021-2022 preliminary budget. On the revenue side, our beginning revenue was $582.45 million. We had total revenue increase of $3.54 million for an estimated total revenue of $584.99 million. On the expenditure side, our beginning expenditures are $576.99 million. Our total estimated expenditure increase is $19 million. Our estimated total expenditure is $595.99 million. We are recommending using $10 million of COVID relief funding that we received uh, to balance the budget. And with the use of that, it, and, and I will let you notice that the COVID relief funding that we're recommending using is $10 million. It matches what we're recommending for the retention stipend. So that is a, a consideration for the board. And that leaves us with the balanced budget uh, for the year, $595.99 million. Did we, did we do something like that last year? The COVID relief funding. We didn't. We did not last year. Last year we actually had a budget surplus, uh, and and we had a six million dollar of, of almost six million dollars last year, that was held over to help us with this year. Okay. So what's next in the budget process? We need to finalize our revenue, uh, tax rate, local assessed value. We will receive our certified values from the appraisal district on July 25th. I talked with uh, the chief appraiser and uh, he is very confident this year that he will have certified certified on the 25th so we don't have to go into September for tax rate adoption. Once we get that, we will submit that information in our tax rate calculation to TEA. They will actually certify our tax rate and actually tell us that it's okay to post that tax rate and then we will be able to finish our state revenue calculation. Uh, future board meetings, public hearings, and budget approval. On July 14th, we have a, a meeting with the district level planning and decision-making committee. We'll present the budget and ask them to recommend the budget to the board. On August 3rd, we'll hold our first public hearing on the budget. August 17th, we'll have an additional public hearing. And at that same meeting, we will ask the board to adopt the budget and the tax rate. And that is all. very much any other questions okay moving on to item e receive financial reports all right mrs garza good evening president hubert members of the board and dr Nall. it is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements for the month ended may 31st our first statement this evening is the balance sheet. The balance sheet shows the district's assets, liabilities, and fund balance. Total assets in the general fund are $343.9 million. Taking a closer look at cash and investments, the majority of our cash and investments in the general fund is in the state pools at $248.7 million. We have short-term investments at 14.9. million. 
investments with Wood Forest National Bank at 10.3, and then our longer-term investments with TCG at 53 million for total cash and investments in the general fund of 327.2. This is our income statement for the year. Total revenues year-to-date in the general fund 527.9 million. In our local revenue 378.5, we have collected the majority of our tax revenue for the year, so. That number is coming in nicely. Total expenditures are 335.6 million. In debt service, 102 million in revenue, 75 million in expenses. We do have our second debt payment of the year in August. This is our 2019 <laughs> bond referendum update. Total funds expended and encumbered year to date, 262.9 million, remaining 388.5 million to complete. Self-funded insurance, we are looking pretty strong year-to-date. Um, we are gearing up for June, July, and August. We have total revenue year-to-date of 40.1 million, total expenses of 39.1. So we are positive for the year of just over a million dollars. However, we are anticipating higher claims in the summer, which is very typical. Uh, participation at our wellness centers, averaging 333 for the year. Our investments as of May, we have par value of just over 661 million. The pools in Wood Forest National Bank investments are yielding just over 11 basis points. Can I ask you to help us yeah. Sure. I'm not counting that right. That's how many months ago? The same year. How are we counting the calendar? Is it calendar year or what are we? It's fiscal year. Fiscal year. Yeah, fiscal year starts in August. So the first month of the fiscal year is September. Or September, right. Mm -hmm. Nine months is a fiscal year for us? No, this is just year to date. Oh, okay. oh it's just year to date she's referring. I yes. I'd like to say year in. Okay. Oh, year to date. Sorry, year to date. All right, our investments, um, our short-term investments are uh, have a WAM of 48 days, yielding just over 25 basis points. Our longer-term investments with TCG, have a WAM of 461 days, yielding at 1.15%. And our com combined portfolio is just uh, over 19 basis points and compared to our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill at 0 0.01. Thank you, Ms. Garza. Thank you. All right, we have executive yes, sir. session tonight. Yeah. A closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained on the notice for this meeting as authorized by section 551.071 and 551.074 of, of the Texas Open Meeting Act. Should the board determine that any fi final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be either the be at either the public meeting upon the re reconvening of this public meeting or at the sequential public meeting at the board of, of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine. The closed session of the board will now be held. The time is 8.57. All right, item, uh, let's see here. Mr. President, I motion, I move. Okay. Back in at 9.35, I move to items, yeah. item 10. <laughs> Mr. President, I move that the board approve the superintendent's contract extending the contract for one year until June 1st, 2026, and approving other amendments as discussed in executive session. Do I have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, I have a motion, a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? A left up to uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. No, nope. we have one more item. We have item 11. My turn. <laughs> item 11, receive local policy manual update 117. You have as much time as you need. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Well, I would like to talk about each separate policy before we go tonight. Now, you, you all are, are accustomed to local policy manual updates. You know, you can peruse it. This is for information only. This is a, a, a big update, but it only has three uh, local policies in it. I put, um, we, we tweaked DEC a little bit more. It's the one in the update that's gone undergone the most revision because TASB, they're one of their big COVID-19 projects because everyone's DEC 
um, has every district that they have has gotten out of control. It's included a lot of information that it shouldn't. That's really more appropriate for procedure. And every district that they have, imagine this, has a unique DEC policy. So while we were all kind of stuck at home, they um, evaluated every school district's DEC and sent back recommendations about what should be removed and put into procedure. And so we've tweaked ours even a little bit more and it makes it hard to read the formattings a little bit off, but you'll get the gist of it. And so when we come back in um, July, I'll ask you to adopt the three uh, other local policies, including DEC um, and, and uh, I'll be. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. All right. <laughs> now you can <laughs> turn. <laughs> All right, very good. Just turn the volume. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Um, so that's information only. Yes. All right, very good. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? No. <laughs> you entertain a motion to adjourn? So I would like to take nominations. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you.